Hi, Michelle, can you please unmute for the online participants? Yes, I can see the slides. You guys are good? Okay. And can you guys online see the slides okay? Yeah? Hopefully. I can't see any chats. I'm going to leave that up to you, Michelle, to, to watch can the chats. Can you? Yes, they're going to text. Okay. So, 20. I'm uh, Cheryl Cole. I'm one of the medical oncologists uh, here at BC Cancer, and it is really great to see everybody in person. And I see lots of really small screens on the top over there. So everybody that's on Zoom that were able to attend the meeting today, so welcome. Um, I'm here representing, of course, Lung Cancer Canada, for which I sit on the board of directors, as well as BC Cancer, which is where I work. And happy to have um, people from BBC and from Inspire Health to kind of join us and chat about things. Um, and I was uh, asked to speak about new treatments, and I kind of thought well, there are a lot of new treatments, um, so there's a lot to talk about. So I kind of honed it down to kind of principles and sort of thinking about uh, how we develop drugs and how do we move things forward. Um, so sort of giving an overview in, from that perspective, but also, of course, there's time afterwards to ask very specific questions about things um, per se, because perhaps what I've actually covered may not be what you were interested in, but happy to chat about other things. And I divided it into two areas, uh, targeted therapy and immunotherapy, because that's really where we've had the most advances. Of course, chemotherapy is always in our back pocket, but that didn't feel like a new treatment to talk about. So, so I'm going to start with targeted therapy. Um, and, and I think the important thing for thinking about targeted therapy is figuring out where you're actually working. So if you think about the body, the body consists of a multitude of organs, your brain, your heart, your lungs, they all work in conjunction together effectively for good health. And those organs are made of cells, which all have different functions within those organs, again, working in, in conjunction together effectively, so that you know, the body works properly. And within those cells, there are proteins. That's that little thing in the very bottom of my picture. And proteins potentially turn off and on as needed to control cell processes. And so that protein is what we would call a receptor. And so receptor proteins are really important. They're part of the normal function of your body. So they are necessary um, to, to uh, regulate things. Um, and they have you know, the function of turning on, potentially when they bind something, or turning off when something is not bound, um, so that you have this on and off signaling of those proteins for the cells to grow and, and to function properly. The problem is, with cancer, is that sometimes that signal is broken. And what happens is you get a signal that's always turned on, either because something's always bound to that protein, or because the protein is mutated and it constantly signals, so you have this on problem. And so what happens if you have at the bottom you know, the representation of a whole bunch of on proteins, on proteins leads to cancer cells so growing, uh, multiplying and developing and going to different areas of the body, and of course, forming tumors. So that's kind of the principle when we're thinking about um, targeted therapies, is really how do we turn that signal off? So we have a problem in that these protein signals are on, so we now need to work to turn that off. And so if you look in the protein on the sort of left side, you have this, this thing that actually my, oops, sorry, binds into the protein. And so there's different ways of turning it off. For example, on the top, you kind of have that lock and key sense where you've got uh, the receptor on the bottom, um, and then you have something that binds into it very well, and so it totally turns it off. Or you might have something where we're developing a new drug, and then that drug sort of looks about right, but it doesn't bind very well. So that's not going to be something that's effective at turning it off. The other thing is not only do you need a good fit, but you also have to have a good fit that sticks well together. So it's kind of, you think about magnets. So you've got magnets, you know, positive and negative, they, they go together, but sometimes you've got a positive and a positive, and they push against each other a little bit. So that's what's meant to be represented in the bottom. The, the question of the why I put that don't know emoji in there is, do you want it to bind really tight or not? And the reason why you might not want it to bind really well is because remember those proteins have a normal function. So if you block it too well, you're gonna get more side effects. And so this is that part of drug development that's really challenging when we're looking at, okay, what kind of drug is, is good because you need to turn off the signal, but you have to be able to be, enable it to be able to do its normal processes. 
So that's kind of around the development uh, of drugs and why it is often challenging um, to be able to do this. I think the good news is that there's lots of what we call driver mutations or mistakes that are potentially turned on in lung cancer. So if you look at the pie graph on the left, um, you see that the first step when we, when we look at cancers is, is the pathologist looks under the microscope and says, okay, I think it is this type of cancer. Um, and for small cell and squamous cell, um, we're going to talk a little bit, that's probably more related to the immunotherapy kind of options. But for uh, non-squamous cells, so that's like adenocarcinomas, uh, large cell, not otherwise specified, sort of a bigger kind of group, you can see that when we take the DNA out of those cancer cells, and sequence that DNA to look for mistakes, that there are a whole bunch of different mistakes in proteins that we identify. There are lots of them there. We don't have drugs for all of these things on the pie, but at least we understand more about the biology of what's behind it that is the driver of turning on the, the cancer process. And so I was gonna focus on uh, a couple of these, uh, groups, probably the more common ones, um, but you'll see that the little black part is, is pretty small for where we're not quite sure um, what is potentially turning on the cancer process. So the first one I was going to talk about is EGFR, which is called the epidermal growth factor receptor. And it is the most common, I think, particularly in Vancouver, mutation that's identified uh, for lung cancer. Um, it is typically associated with people who don't smoke, um, who have uh, non squamous pathology, and it is uh, associated with um, being Asian. So, this has been known um, and had an option for treatment for over a decade now. So, we've actually uh, gone through a whole first and second generation of drugs, and now we're on the third generation of drugs, which is great because I think that just tells us. You get the science, and then you have to constantly work to evolve that science, right? You want to identify new treatment options, and you want to identify better treatment options. We always have the ability to do things better than we're currently doing them. And so for common mutations, um, what we have is osteomeric liver and um, And that probably encompasses about 80% of the mutations that we see is what we identify um, for uncommon mutations. And so this is that part where I was telling you, we've got this, we've got this uh, mutation or protein and you got to bind something to it. Well, it depends where that protein is actually mutated, how you need to develop the drug that's actually going to bind to it. So for the uncommon ones, which is again about 15 to 20%, we have another drug that we use, which is a fat med and geotrip. And exon 20 insertion mutations are something actually that we've discovered probably more recently as being a totally separate pocket of types of mutations. So this, um, I think development for drugs in this area has probably been over the past maybe four or five years, even though we've known about EGFR as a driver of cancer for at least uh, 15 years. Um, we've been, again, working to hone down and understand things even better by learning what happens when people with these different kind of treatment options. And then if, um, a, a, as you can imagine, you know, cancer cells are smart, at some point they eventually develop resistance. So the drugs that we first choose may not work as well. And sometimes it's a bit of a balance. So some of the, the cancer component may still be under control and a portion of it may change a little bit and become resistant. So some is you know, totally stable and other areas are growing and we have different approaches depending on what the balance of that potentially is. But if we see the balance is that more of the, the cancer cells are resist, resistant to the higher population, then we look to next line treatments. Um, and so there's lots of clinical trials going on in that space, kind of saying, okay, well, can we combine different drugs for different pathways? Can we combine some targeted therapies with chemotherapy? So different kind of options we're exploring there. And of course, as always, we have the backbone of chemotherapy. And I know chemotherapy is not the most exciting thing to talk about, but it's, it's been um, a backbone of treatment for decades and actually helps a lot of people feel better. So even though it's not you know, the exciting thing, um, I think it's really, really important part of that full treatment pathway. Um, the next uh, mutation probably that we've, most, we've known about for, for the longest that I've been able to target is ALK, which is anaplastic lymphoma kinase, uh, first identified in lymphoma, that's the name. Um, but since 2007, we realized, okay, this is a driver for lung cancers. Um, as we have a number of different first-line treatments that again have been researched and have gone, again have gone first and second generation to third generation drugs. Um, and then for, for second line treatments, uh, we have the option of chemotherapy. 
And I think we're still working on figuring out who might benefit from additional targeted therapy and what is the right targeted therapy in that scenario. And then and I the, the, the new kid to the block for harassment, which is really necessarily new. We've known for over 50 years that this is involving cancer development um, across multiple different kinds of cancers. The problem is we Although there's been decades and decades of research and we've done some obesity cancer, we have not been able to figure out how to turn it off until we found a specific mutation, which is called G12C, which has a certain shape that enabled the drug to be developed to bind and turn it off. And so um, a drug that was very recently approved by Health Canada um, is called Sodoracin, um, is available for people after they've had chemotherapy. Um, and we also have many clinical trials available, like, for example, Atagrasib and Pembrolizumab are certainly available um, in the Vancouver's program. And many other targets to come. We should, I showed you that pie kind of outlining all the different um, things that we've identified as we've learned over time. Uh, I borrowed this slide from the Lung Cancer Research Foundation, which is from the, the U.S., just showing you over time the number of drugs that have been approved by the FDA specifically for lung cancer. And you can see sort of a, an absence of progress in, in the first few, but then um, from 2010 and onwards, a really an impressive rise in the number of targeted therapies and immunotherapies as options for patients, which is great. So I'm gonna flip our switch a little bit and talk a bit about immunotherapy, a bit different approach. What we were just talking about were targeted therapies. And for most people with a driver mutation, immunotherapy is not necessarily as helpful um, as you're uh, focusing on a different population, I think. And, and I think the first thing to acknowledge about you know, the sort of immune system in cancer is that when the immune system fails to recognize damaged cells and destroy them, that's where cancer can actually develop. So it is a failure of the immune system that unfortunately over time people develop the cancers. And again, sort of thinking about full body processes, um, what, what are we talking about when we talk about the immune system? So we have what's called the lymphatic system, which is basically um, a, a liquid-like system that really runs in parallel with your um, circulation, so your blood system. Um, and in that lymphatic system, we have lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are areas where uh, things are processed, for example, if you get a virus, sometimes you might get some lymph nodes uh, enlarged in your neck, or you get like a sore of throat or an infection in the back of your throat. That happens because your, your, um, the filtering system of these lymph nodes recognize that there's a foreign or bad component that's involved and it's recruiting the immune system to actually attack and help with that infection. So you clear the sore throat, you clear the virus, or in certain scenarios, you try to clear the cancer. It doesn't always happen. So that's where it's not seen potentially as cancer cells. And through those lymph nodes and the circulatory system, you have blood traveling through. And of course, blood is a component of a mixture of a, a number of different components. You've got your, your actual blood carrying your oxygen, your platelets that help you with like, you know, um, clotting and things like that. And of course, white blood cells, which are responsible for your immune system or activation of the immune system. So those white blood cells are, are pretty much what we're talking about and turning those on when we talk about immunotherapy, because what we want to do is enable those white blood cells to actually recognize the cancer. So in um, your normal cells, your immune system has to be able to know what's bad and what's good. So if it's bad, they should be able to see a bunch of proteins that will turn it on and destroy the bacteria. If it's good, like your own cells, you have to have signals on it to tell the immune system don't attack me because I'm a good cell and I need to function for this body. And so one of those signals is what we call PDL1. So it's a protein on, on normal cells that enables the immune system, uh, immune system in specific T cells to bind to it to say, okay, this is a normal protein. I should not, this is a normal cell. I should not attack it. I should leave it alone. It's important for the function of the body. So it's kind of a brake slide system to turn off the immune system. So what we want to do when we use immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy is actually turn on the immune system by blocking that interaction. And then the immune system can recognize the cancer cell and, and kill it. So 
This is my uh, diagram of what the immune system might look like. Um, so the immune system is in, in teal, so you have a, like a T cell. Um, it's got a bunch of uh, proteins that stick out on it, and with a normal cell, it interacts together. The PD1 and PDL1 interact with each other, and so the immune system says, oh, it's okay, the cell is good, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm not going to target it for destruction because my, the signals are telling me that this is a normal cell. And so the tumor cells hijack this system. So they start expressing this PDL1 protein. So when the immune system comes by, it says, oh, it's got this protein on it. Actually, it's looking kind of funny, but it's got this protein that on it that tells me it should be normal, so I'm not going to attack it. And so when we're looking at immunotherapy is what we want to do is disrupt that connection. So we don't want it to be able to interact and say, okay, this is actually a normal cell. So my little thunderbolt is um, some of the immunotherapy drugs. That then enables the immune system to recognize that actually this cell doesn't look right. It's got some proteins on it that are not normal. And so I should actually target this cell for death. And so that's how that activation of the immune system happens. So the immunotherapy in itself is not a treatment per se, but actually more about using the immune system in an individual's body to turn on to attack the cancer. And there's a, a variety of different drugs that have been developed to do that. Um, but just like targeted therapy, you have to pick the people who are most likely to benefit, right? Because nobody wants to get treatment that's actually not going to help them or it's going to give them side effects. So we use a biomarker called uh, PDL1 uh, tumor proportion score or TPS. And what it is is, whoops, the slide's a little bit off, but um, it we we take the tumor and we actually stain it to see whether or not the expression of PDL1 is high or low. And so it should have that the 50% should have been on the other side slide where you can see the darker kind of staining. So those are people who are more likely to benefit um, from immunotherapy alone. And people who have a lower uh, marker might need a combination of things like chemotherapy plus immunotherapy or combination immunotherapy um, could potentially benefit from that treatment. So how has this helped us? Well, lots of things happen with immunotherapy. Um, the, there was uh, recently a Health Canada approval for a, a drug called tesaluzumab to increase the chance of cure after somebody's actually had surgery and chemotherapy. For people who've got stage three lung cancer, who've had chemotherapy and radiation, um, we give a year of immunotherapy afterwards, again, to increase that chance of cure. Um, and then for people who have metastatic disease, it has helped people improve their quality of life, to live longer, and kind of choosing the right treatment option depends a little bit on what that biomarker tells us is the right way to move forward. And I think, you know, we think that we know a lot about what we're doing. Actually, there's a whole vast world out there of the immune system and everything else that we don't really understand. And I think as we learn more about it, we're going to be able to develop other kinds of targets, ways of combining things, figuring out when um, our first uh, effort to turn on the immune system uh, works, but then stops working, then how do we uh, turn that back on? So lots of different strategies um, that are coming up that are being uh, explored in trials right now. And so I, I think, you know, um, I, I would say over the course of certainly my career in the past 15 to 16 years that we've gone from predominantly being chemotherapy to now really focusing on the targeted therapy and immunotherapy, which is, which is great. Um, I think that uh, clinical trials have been a really important part of that, and, and BC Cancer has participated in many of those clinical trials that have actually enabled us to, to have these therapies available. And, and I think every day, all, all of us as a community keep working towards making that better. So with that, oh, I, uh, I, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, I'm looking at the slides because I realized I'm going to <laughs> But uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, so what happened is... Can you repeat the question? Oh, right, right, right. Um, so it was a question about uh, the option of um, immunotherapy after surgery. Um, so 
um, there was a, a study done with a, a drug called atezolizumab um, that looked at um, people having surgery and then chemotherapy afterwards and then randomized you to receive a atezolizumab or placebo because um, at that time we didn't know it made a difference. Um, those patients were followed and the number of patients that were cured um, who received the atezolizumab was higher than people who received uh, placebo. So Health Canada actually has approved the therapy, but it's kind of working its way through the funding component. Um, yeah, that very long um, process through Canada <laughs> to actually get drugs funded. But so, so it's a work in progress, I would say, um, at the moment. So follow up to that. Um, do you foresee there being genetic testing being done for patients? I think. Uh, yeah, so I, I think in the province of BC, um, certainly the need for our, sorry, oh, that was a question of um, whether or not we're going to have uh, molecular testing um, in place for that scenario. Um, so I, I would say that the, the pathology lead in the province for molecular testing has been trying really hard to get reflex testing because it's so relevant now at every stage of disease. So if we just did it up front as soon as we recognized it as lung cancer, that would save so much time. Um, it's been and I sat in those meetings. It's been a real work in progress. Um, there's a lot of um, other moving parts um, sort of there. But we certainly, as like um, oncologists, have been advocating for that because you really, the dean, you really want to pick the people. You're going to make people go through like a year of treatment. You really want to pick the right people for that. You want to offer the therapy to people that would benefit the most. And of course, not many people go through therapy that's like, not going to benefit them at all. So absolutely, that has been on the radar and a point of much discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, with COVID, mm -hmm. it brought mRNA technology thanks to the forefront to everybody. Do you see that technology um, on the treatment side? On the treatment side? Treatment side. Um, you know, it's it's a good question. I'm not sure where that's going to happen. Where, uh, sorry, the question was about mRNA technology as a treatment strategy in lung cancer. I'm not sure where that's going to land at the moment. Um, I, I think from when I look at things that are proposed to us as potential for clinical trials, um, what's coming to us mostly um, is, is really more refined targeted therapies in smaller and smaller pockets. Um, some of the immunotherapy things have been, a lot of the immunotherapy proposals that have come through have been really combination because I have not seen a lot of mRNA type of things coming through specifically um, in the pipeline for trials at, at the moment. Um, but that's not to say that that not, might not become a reality and that you're right, COVID did shift a lot of science and technology to move a lot faster than it has in the past and sort of the equipment processes and all those kinds of things. So I think it's really possible to for uh, targeted drug therapy is given frontline and then after that stopped working there were two options like the combination of targeted drug therapy and chemotherapy or just chemotherapy how like who gets what is that is that based on their um, genetic mutation or right yeah good question um so the question is um after receiving the targeted therapy, if it's no longer working, how do we choose the next line of treatment? Um, and I think it's complicated because I probably oversimplified it on my slide <laughs> um, because I think it depends on what it looks like. So, it, and, and I had mentioned there's this balance between some cells for control versus sort of smaller pockets that perhaps are growing um, and what that balance looks like. Um, so sometimes if it's mostly under control and a small component that's growing, we actually things like local treatments like radiotherapy or radiotherapy or some kind of um, local treatments and we actually have a, a new working group that's just started to actually work with all of our providers of the local therapies um, with uh, you know the medical oncology group to kind of figure out who is the right person what are the kind of options and what is the best strategy depending on location to, to deal with that um, so that's one piece and then I think and then, of course, continue with the target therapy. And if the balance is then shifting and you have more sort of resistant kind of uh, cells, it depends on what's out there. So when I talk about those combinations, like a lot of those are, are on clinical trials. Um, so oftentimes, um, depending on the site, for example, EGFR, if you re recharacterize, you might identify what 
is turned on and then be able to select a clinical trial on the basis of that. Um, or some of the clinical trials are just, you know, saying, okay, well, there's resistance. So we would just randomize to these potential options. I mean, that's a trial we currently have, and they don't require recharacterization because they, that, that study, we don't actually know what is the way that, that we need to act or which population we actually have to identify. So, so I think it really depends yeah. on um, what trials. I can't because the signs on that is really just, it's ongoing, like a bunch of stuff is presented even this year with smaller subset. Um, Maybe, yeah. Let me try it on this. Right, that there are going to be options. You just have to find the right people, the right patients, the right mutations for the right treatment to connect all of those pieces together. And can you just clarify, we re-characterize as like we do the, um, the genetic testing. Or yeah, so, so again, it depends, right? You, you would look at the, the part, the price under control. We don't really, we're not as interested in that because it's under control, right? So you presume it has similar phenotype as what you had in the beginning. It's the part that's changing or evolving that we would often think about potentially biopsying and then recharacterizing with molecular um, testing, so sequencing, um, or doing liquid biopsies or things like that. Yeah. Recharacterizing yeah. only in the setting of um, trial options, basically. Uh, as you know, um, funding for most molecular tests is attached to treatment. And at this moment, we don't have any standard therapies for which we need to recharacterize. So then the government's like, well, why should we pay for it? It's really interesting from the perspective of understanding um, what's happening. And so from characterization and thinking about clinical trials. Um, and, and I guess, you know, um, what I often get from people at other centers is email questions about, here, here are some features for this individual. Do you have a clinical trial for them? And then um, we would look to see if we had something in the lung cancer portfolio. And then we would look to see if there's something in a phase one portfolio to kind of fit, because really, Phase one, the phase one portfolio is really evolving, right? Because they are actually trying to connect mutations to people. It's just because those drugs are not um, at the point where we can move that into bigger groups. But it is becoming much more, I think, refined um, science there. So, so I do get queries from from other people about things. I mean, I think for us, um, certainly in, in the group that we practice in, we're very interested in ensuring that we have these opportunities and we try to choose things that fit people we see, like we try to choose the trials we think are going to help the most people in, in, in the group. Um, I think most um, um, clinical trial groups, even outside of lung cancer, kind of try to do the, the same thing. Um, but, you know, like I am proud to say that we were part of the study that actually got osteomaritin approved, right? Like that was, that was part of everybody in this province contributing to that science. Um, and, and we recognize that's the only way to move forward. So presumably in other centers, other physicians would have that kind of same um, thought process. And, and if not, it never hurts to say, is there a trial for me? Yeah. Is there, can you ask if there's something, right? If, if you don't know, and then Lung Cancer Canada, the website has like clinical trials connections and there's some like national thing, but it, it never hurts to ask. And then that person might just send an email to someone to say, okay, this is the scenario. And it is, it's not always there, but you know, we do try to be reasonable about our choices to offer the most for as many patients as we can. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, it's pretty good. I would say it's a mix. So oftentimes when like, we're seeing people, we're like thinking about, okay, this is what we have and this is what we would offer to somebody. But I also have people come to me and say, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z trial. Um, and then I, it depends, but I would just email the investigator on X, Y, or Z trial and say, I have so-and-so who's interested. Um, the candidate is easy because well, coming in the healthcare system in the States is a lot harder because it's institution by institution, how uh, payment works for getting participating in trials in the States. Um, and, and then just to see, you know, then they usually send me back the criteria and say, well, these are the things you have to meet. Does a person meet these things? Because it makes no sense to travel somewhere if you don't even meet the original criteria for safety at that trial. Um, and then just see, so I have sent people, well, where they usually got, they've got family in, in the country um, to get access to new therapies that look really promising. Right? Um, so it's, it, it's definitely uh, out there. So you can do a bit of your own research again, like Cancer Canada has um, stuff there. You can see our trials certainly on our website for BC Cancer um, and just asking. I don't, I don't think it hurts to ask. Sometimes there isn't something that, that's a good fit. Um, and sometimes the standard is the best thing to do at that moment. But it doesn't mean that at some point in the future, it might not be an option around. Are any of those drug combinations after first line treatment, such as osmertinib, um, really successful? Or I'm wondering what stage they're at, and um, are any of them close to um, finishing and becoming approved? <laughs> um, all that. Can you tell her I'll leave the apartment? <laughs> Um, so, when? <laughs> so I would say in terms of the EGFR client post osteomeritinib, like the trial that we have right now is looking at lisertinib, amidantumab, plus, or, plus chemotherapy, um, and, and a kind of different combinations um, of that. And then I will also say that if I kind of look at where the, oh, sorry, the question was about post uh, EGFR osteomeritinib, so where are trials going? Yeah. Um, the, the, Biggest area that seems to have focus is um, MET amplification. So, co so if you think about resistance, you can have, um, there's really three big pockets of resistance. You have a mutation in the existing mutation. So each of our mutation, develop resistance mutation in each of our. Second way of resistance is you upregulate another pathway in the cell, whatever it might be, FET or whatever other kind of drug pathway involved in the cancer cell process. Or the third way is that you get what we call lineage plasticity. So the type of tumor mutates, so you go from an adenocarcinoma to a squamous cell carcinoma or a small cell, right? So those are the three big pathways that we're going to looking for. The last pathway, typically chemotherapy. In the EGFR mutations, there are, is some drug development in that space, but everything changed when we started osteomeric. I also got a flu shot uh, appointment there. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> we'll, okay, we'll, we'll get your question on the the chat in a second. I mean, on the on the on online in a second. Um, so so we had all this drug development going for resistance mutations to the earlier generation drugs, and then osmeritinib came out, and then the whole type of pattern of resistance changed. So what we thought we were aiming for, we weren't aiming for that. So that's kind of ongoing work there. That sort of second pathway of turning on other pathways. The biggest amount of work is being done, I think, with MET. Like it seems to me that all the combinations are looking at sometimes combination of osteomeritinib or other EGFR inhibitors plus a MET drug. And some of those are in selected populations, so they're looking for MET application in different ways, and some of them are in more general populations. Um, I think the most recent study that came out was the INSIGHT study, which was um, um, at ESMO this year, combining a MET inhibitor, which is Tepotinib, with osteomeritinib that showed really good results, but it was an early phase study. So we're like here, and the goalpost is here, so we're like that. So I would say that, the, that at the moment, the best options we have are really around clinical trials for EGF, for resistance to EGFR, looking again at those targeted pathways. So if you had to guess, when do you think those trials <laughs> um, Like I, um, it's hard to, you know, when you're kind of in the middle of it, which is where I feel like we are right now, it's hard for us to guess what that goalpost is going to be. Because I think about Egypt, like the Osmeritinib study that we did, and when we finally got that approved, and we were like, I think, from opening that study to actually getting drug approval 
school and funding is about five years. So just thinking about that as an example. Now the science moves faster sometimes, right? We're getting better at doing a lot of things potentially. Right. I don't know who on the Zoom had a question. Thank you. Oh, I do. Um, so the first uh, question on Zoom is they were asking how many biomarkers are tested in BC. Um, so they're leaving Saskatchewan, they only test for treatable biomarkers. So in BC, we run a focus panel. Focus panel is DNA and RNA. Oh, we wrote one panel. Oh, let's see. 50, 37, it's something like that. Because uh, the, the foundation wants like 256, right? So, liquid foundation one. Um, so, it's probably in the range of, I'm going to say 50. But I, I will also say that uh, in BC, the strategy that we have employed is to use a single panel for multiple tumor sites, right? Because um, from a testing perspective, financially, that made more sense. So, we get testing for a, a number of different tumor sites with the same panel. That's why we have more biomarkers that are not necessarily relevant to lung cancer on that panel. So that's kind of how we address it here. Thank you. And the uh, second question is relating to um, how long targeted therapies last. Uh, we can't answer you know, questions about personal, um, personal matters, but specifically they, they were asking how long would to bristle or the Latin last? You know, I, I think it is so individual dependent um, that I've had the whole gamut of, you know, up to a decade to only a few months. Um, the clinical trials try to help inform us around that. Um, and, and so, you know, the clinical trials give us, um, in terms of disease control, um, with, with to bristle about a year and a half. But I just want to comment that a clinical trial different definition of progression is different than what a clinical definition of progression is. Because a clinical trial definition of progression is 30% bigger than the smallest amount that it ever became. So if you started off with a 10 centimeter combination of tumors, you ended up with a one centimeter and you ended up, well, sorry, it was a limit. So if you ended up with two centimeters and it went to 2.6 centimeters, that would be considered progression, even though you went from 10 to 2.6, that in a clinical trial is called progression. That from a clinician's perspective, is that clinically relevant? Probably not. Still probably getting more benefit out of that therapy that, that would warrant continuing that treatment rather than needing to change. So I guess that's one thing to say about when you look at clinical trial data and definitions around time. In terms, and, and, and sort of same concept with, with, with ALK and, and, and longevity. Um, I think the ALK inhibitors seem to uh, be able to control the disease for longer, um, certainly than, than what we've seen with each of our but. <laughs> yeah, can you take a step back from the whole treatment realm for just a second and sort of give us a picture of some of the statistics around lung cancer in BC? My estimate is that we have about 6,000 lung cancer patients in BC. Um, we probably see six patients a day that are dying, um, but those are very general numbers. And I guess I'm, my interest is, is we've got this little band of patients that are gathering together and that's changing the face of patient connection and patient support here. And I'm, and I'm just wondering, like, so we've got 15 patients that are meeting every two weeks. Are there more, like, what's reasonable? I mean, in terms of connecting patients, um, how many patients are there out there and, and what should we be doing from an advocacy perspective um, in terms of trying to reach them and support them and give them information um, and help them understand what it is they're up to? Um, so the question was about how to, I guess, really how do we advocate better in BC? Um, I think being here is great. I think being connected to lung cancer in Canada is great. Um, that we have supports within BC Cancer as well to try to form support groups um, and connections in that fashion. Um, I think from an advocacy perspective within the province, 
that most of our provincial um, needs go up nationally, right? Like what happens at a national level defines what the patient experience is going to be within BC. So I think the national advocacy piece around CADF and how drugs get approved and funded is probably the, the most important way in which we can change through a trajectory of the future for many other people. Um, and I think, of course, you know, we all try as best as possible to have a voice there, both in the clinician input as well as, as the patient input, as Michelle goes around trying to find people all the time to help with those things. I think that, in, in my mind, that's the, the biggest piece of advocacy work that we can do sort of for the future. On an individual supporting type of level, I think having access to, you know, Lung Cancer Canada, Peer to Peer Network, the social work things that we have for BC Cancer, or all ways of doing it. And, and I think Zoom has changed things for sure, uh, right? To be able to connect and stuff like that. Um, I think Bonnie and my work in terms of research have identified one of the gaps with Zoom is it's some sometimes different cohorts of people are less comfortable with that. And sort of Bonnie's doing a lot of work to try to, how do you get, how do you access, how do you provide support for, for those different kinds of um, patients as well? And we're kind of, she's doing that also the research hat to ensure that we are actually being as accessible as possible, not just about the treatment you write, um, about all the support pieces too. Maybe Michelle wants to stop talking. Because <laughs> <laughs> we need to move on. Let's we'll take one more question. <laughs> yeah, my, my question kind of ties in. Um, I have bladder cancer and I have not had any success finding an environment like this or a group like this. So I really enjoy sitting and listening to them. So I guess my question is, what do you see other cancer groups, you know, prostate cancer, breast cancer, what do you see them doing well that lung cancer can adopt right. and to improve? Okay, we'll let Michelle answer. <laughs> Why don't you just use this mic? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, so essentially, yeah, uh, part, part, of, part of their success is, is um, sheer survivor numbers, right? When you're dealing with cancers like, like ours, um, you don't have as many survivors, and so therefore you don't have as many applicants. They do do a great job of marketing, I mean, you know, um, marketing themselves, but there, there's just sheer numbers of, of survivorship is, is what drives the, the, the the large visibility that they have. When you say they, you're like specifically talking about like breast and I'm talking about breast. Yeah, you, I mean you you specifically yeah. talked about breast, prostate, breast, and, and the built that's those those organizations. But they also they also do things like they really promote early screening. And this is and this is something that Lung Cancer Canada and then um, has been working, has been working to work for years. I mean, definitely we knew early screening was going to save lives. And it may be a cost factor. I mean, there, there are provinces that consider because of the, the DCT scans, and there are more lung cancer patients diagnosed than any other cancer. So prostate, breast, colorectal com combined doesn't, isn't as many um, patients as, as, lung can, as lung cancer patients. So when you're talking about CT screening, it's not just a simple blood test, the costs go up, right? So there really needs to be a government commitment for that. And NBC has, you know, Ontario is the first to announce a program, but their program is very limited in terms of the locations and the numbers that they're doing. And, and so is the, um, there's, there's an Alberta uh, screening program, but they're also very limited locations so we we are I, we're actively pushing on that. the two elections that just took place were part of a group called right to survive that um have been advocating strongly in uh, quebec and ontario we will continue throughout you know um, throughout 2023 to continue advocating for screening sorry could you introduce yourself oh yes yeah, sorry <laughs> so i'm michelle ray I am the coordinator of um, I'm the coordinator of patient support initiatives at Lung Cancer Canada. I've been with them for about six years since about um, late 2015. 
So I think we'll go ahead with the agenda and I will introduce Bonnie. Um, Bonnie, Bonnie Lung is a nurse practitioner at BC Cancer in Vancouver. Um, she's been supporting patient, patients with lung cancer and their families since 2014. She's currently pursuing her PhD at BBC School of Nursing and her proposed thesis work will focus on improving cancer care for older adults and immigrants with cancer. to, before we begin, just acknowledge the land that we are gathered here today. So we are currently on the traditional ancestral and ceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, who have nurtured and cared for our waters and our lands for all time. And I would like to um, just show you that this is the reconciliation pool that is on the UBC campus here. It was erected in 2017. And it, it's to um, commemorate the survivors and the people that have um, died in the residential school era in Canada. And you can see, it's not very clear, but the bottom of the pole here is actually, um, it, it represents a residential school and there are over a thousand copper nails that are hammered into this uh, building structure uh, that were uh, hammered in by either uh, residential school survivors or their family members. So it is very special and being on campus, you should I, I take a, it's I about a 15 minute walk that way. I am definitely going to find it. Um, uh, so, full disclaimer I am not a social worker and I am not an accountant. Uh, I definitely don't want you to manage your money in any way because I only know how to spend. I don't know how people <laughs> save or invest their money. Um, but I am a caregiver, I was a caregiver for, for my mother and cancer. and. I'm also a healthcare, healthcare professional, so I do have to fill up forms and help people navigate some of these um, challenges and practical needs. So I will do my best to explain what's out there. So we will talk a little bit about medication coverage, um, financial supports that are available and some practical supports, especially for people that are coming or going out of town for their treatments. So, um, Fortunately for us, uh, any medications or any anti-cancer treatments that are approved by the BC formulary or pharmacy formulary are covered. So you don't have to pay for your medication. That includes all of our oral targeted therapies that we take at home or injections that we take at home. So we're very fortunate with that. Um, but a lot of our supportive care medications, for example, pain medications or nausea or vomiting pain medication that we uh, take for chemotherapy, that is not covered. And I think a lot of misconceptions that I see kind of regularly is that people don't actually understand the difference between MSP Pharmacare and Fair Pharmacare. And there, there are differences. As residents of BC, we have to enroll in the Medical Services Plan or MSP in order to get coverage for medical services with physicians or um, certain dental or oral surgeries that are performed in the hospital that gets covered under MSP. And you have to be enrolled in MSP in order to get access to Pharmacare which covers certain medications, uh, medical supplies and devices, and some pharmacy services. Now, within Pharmacare itself, there are 12 different Pharmacare plans. The main takeaway is that we need to make sure we are all registered for Fair Pharmacare. And Fair Pharmacare is, um, it, it requires a special application because it, we have to consent to Pharmacare, for Pharmacare to access our CRA documents or records for the previous two years for them to calculate your annual deductible for the cost of your medications. So um, when we register online, PharmaCare will actually send us a hard copy of a consent form that we have to sign and fill out and send back to Victoria. Um, and then they will access the files from CRA to calculate the deductible. So um, they, with a deductible for an individual, um, you, they will cover up to 70% of the medication costs um, once you've met your deductible and for people that are older um, that are born before 1940 they will cover up to 75 percent but as a household the family maximum if you've reached that family maximum in a year it's a hundred percent of the costs are covered by family care so that could be a big um, 
money saver in a sense. And so a lot of our patients like to come to us to get medication refills in December because they have to big, pay a big chunk of money for the medications right after the holidays when you're going to be real to pay for. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And um, I think the um, common thing that happens with people that are getting diagnosed with lung cancer is that you're work, you're working, so paying the deductible is not a problem, but now you stop working because you have to have surgery or you have to get treatments and you're dealing with all these symptoms. Well, now your income is diminished or you don't make any income at all and you can't manage to pay about a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars of this deductible. So there is um, a form you could fill up with Pharmacare for them to reevaluate your current situation to have the deductible lowered. So that's something that's good to keep in mind um, because that happens a lot. And, you know, it's it's just the nature of our illness that we have to stop work. And if you're not sure if you've registered for Fair Pharmacare, I did include a link that you could go on and you just enter in your Pharmacare card number. Um, or you can always go to your neighborhood friendly pharmacist and they can check in their system very quickly for you just to let you know if you're registered or not. Um, some of us are very fortunate to have third party uh, extended health benefits and it's great to have it um, because it can you can get reimbursed for the deductible that you have to pay for your medications um, certain situations um, with extended health benefits is that they may cover the cost of some medication that may not be approved by the provincial formulary yet and so uh, if your oncologist thinks that, well, maybe this treatment may be helpful, but we, we're not covering this right now. Some of these insurance companies you can work with can they cover the, half of the cost, some of the cost, or maybe all of the cost. So if you do have extended health, it's good to reach out to your HR or your employee benefits department just to see what's being covered, how much will they cover, and is there a lifetime maximum that they will cover for medications? Um, there's a, with Pharmacare, like I said, there are 12 different plans. One of the plans is called Plan P or the BC Palliative Care Benefits. And it is for people to support um, the cost of medications, usually when they have a very serious illness and perhaps um, near the end of life or expect to have a life limiting illness of less than six months, let's say. Now, sometimes we register our patients on Plan P because they have such a high burden of disease or illness or symptoms, they feel really well, they have to use a lot of medications when they're just getting diagnosed. That doesn't mean that we're saying that the patient is going to die at six months, but we think that there's a high need to support these patients. And a lot of times we actually fill out these forms in the beginning and a year later, somebody sends us a fact and say, hey, do we need to renew this? Because you know, patients are actually doing better. We might have to actually cancel them off of this plan or we might have to renew it a year later. So it's not, um, don't panic. If you see the word palliative care benefits, it's actually nice because they do cover a lot of the supportive care medications and a lot of medical supplies. So that's, you have to be registered for Fair Pharma Care in order to be enrolled in this program. So yeah, Fair Pharma Care. Um, when people are really struggling with the cost of their medications, um, our patient and family counseling department does have a small funding pool to support patients and, and provide them with um, some cash to kind of pay for the medication. So reach out to our friendly uh, social workers and ca uh, counselors at our BC Cancer Centers. Um, and sometimes it's relevant. Um, you can talk to our drug access navigators if there are any sort of compassionate access programs with pharmaceutical companies to get a discount for some of the support of their medications. Um, that is an option sometimes, not all the time, but it's worth asking. And your oncologist would know too. Or next patient. So financial support. This is a very, um, I'm not an accountant. I'm married into a family of accountants, but they're all not useful because they're corporate accountants. So nobody does personal accounting. So it was very frustrating trying to ask them for help through <laughs> this section. Um, but I'm really going to be talking about government assistance programs here because we fill out a lot of forms for our patients a lot and it's super confusing so it was a great educational process for me going through this section uh, because there are so many forms out there and it's so confusing what who's eligible who's not eligible how much money will you get reimbursed and everything and you're more than welcome to have these slides if you find them helpful because there is a lot of information and just to kind of mention quickly some of these slides that I have, I write down the form name. So if you need to 
get access to these forms, you can just punch in on Google and punch in that number and it actually bring you right to the form. So it's all listed there for your convenience. So more than happy to share my slides. Um, so in terms of insurance, um, employment insurance, there are funding through our federal government and our provincial government. There's some for, to support patients and there are people that are their money to support our caregivers as well. So that's good to keep in mind. Um, so with the federal government, there is the employment insurance sickness benefit. So it is a short-term uh, insurance benefit for up to 15 weeks. Um, there was uh, in the federal, uh, federal budget in 2021, there was a commitment to uh, reform this EI benefit to extend from 15 weeks to 26 weeks of coverage. It was supposed to happen sometime now, but it hasn't been announced yet. I think there's just so much going on right now in politics. Um, but hopefully we'll see that soon because 15 weeks is honestly not enough for a lot of our patients if they're going through chemo and radiation and then the recovery piece of things. Um, so hopefully we can see that in the near future because that will really help support our patients going through treatments and dealing with all the recovery that is involved. Um, now with the BC government, there's a persons with disability that you could apply for. It's a very arduous process. I personally haven't really been super successful in getting people uh, registered for this because uh, a lot of the questions that they ask on these application forms is really about um, whether somebody has sensory impairment, so blindness, deafness, uh, they're on dialysis, if they are wheelchair bound. Um, but a lot of our lung cancer patients they're you know, able-bodied, they're feeling generally well, but they are on a lot of treatments and uh, they have a life-limiting illness, but they don't meet the criteria of, of being somebody with disability. So it, it is kind of frustrating. And I think that's something we should think about as advocacy work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it, yes, we- It's a full invisible disability thing. Exactly. It's interesting because this is invisible, invisible disability week. Yes, it is. It is Invisible Disability Week this week. Um, but I think that's um, something that we as a community really need to advocate for is increased supports and services for people living with cancer because people are living well, living longer with a chronic condition and yet um, there are no supports to help them. And so that's something for us all to find, just to answer your question earlier. <laughs> you were just saving that. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm really going to breeze through this because it's, it's, there's so many slides here, so I apologize. Um, so I think one useful tip about the persons with disability application form is that um, when you register online, they will assign an employment and assistance worker to help you fill out the form and kind of help you and then navigate the whole system. There are three main sections to this application. And the first part is the personal information piece. So um, one of the tips that I was reading about was have, um, have that checklist with you on your very worst day. So you take off what kind of impairments or difficulties or restrictions you're experiencing and just take it off so that you can have it. Because if, you know, sometimes they'll ask you what you did yesterday and you're like, I can't remember. So if you have that checklist on that you feel miserable today, fill it up because we want to know at your worst day what is impacting your life and your, your um, ability to perform your activities. Section two and three is completed by healthcare professionals. And the application form, you only get one copy, so you don't really want to mess up your form. So we can photocopy sections two and three and fill it out yourself and make the separate appointment with your GP, your nurse practitioner, your oncologist, and have those that completed, self-completed section and show them, you know, this is what I'm having some problems with because if the physician or the nurse practitioner is like, oh yeah, I, I can see that, I understand what you're going to do, talk about this, it's so much faster for them to fill it out and so much easier rather than asking you point by point, oh, why are you having problems with this and this and this and this? So those are two helpful kind of tips I was reading about. Uh, there is a good checklist uh, through Disability Alliance BC. They have many helpful help sheets online that I kind of put a link at the bottom for the end of the presentation that you can look to just to kind of get little tips, tidbits on how to make the application process a little bit easier because it's definitely not easy to get that. Uh, in 
terms of the federal funding for um, kind of longer term uh, insurance benefits is the CPP disability benefit. And you have to be under age 65 just after 65 when you get CPP plan, but if you are under 65 and you do not work for medical reasons, you can get the CPP insurance benefit or disability benefit. Uh, it covers anywhere from 500 to about almost $1,500 per month. It's not a lot, um, well, considering inflation and the cost of living these days. So that's another advocacy <laughs> piece about how can we support people living with uh, chronic conditions. Um, Generally, it takes a little bit of time to complete this process, um, but if there's somebody that's living with um, life limiting illness with a really poor prognosis, six months is usually kind of the benchmark. There is the terminal illness application and they do expedite this and try to get the application uh, approved within five business days. So uh, it's kind of have to, they, they do recognize that there's a need. So that's kind of the two distinctions when you're completing this form, these forms. How caregivers um, are important to consider because a lot of people have to take their take time off to come to appointments and you know, provide care at home. And so we need to recognize that our caregivers also need benefits and supports. And so with the federal government, there is the caregiver benefit for adults, and it is a kind of a limited time, um, up to 15 weeks of an insurance uh, permit insurance to support caregivers. And there is also a, a longer term one. Usually this is more reserved for people with end of life care that requires more intensive caregiving. Um, and that's up to 26 weeks of coverage. And that could actually be divided among one or two or three people. Um, so if, for example, there's uh, there are two kids that are looking after their parent who's going through an illness, they can divide it 50 or 60, 40, and then each can share those 26 weeks. So we have that. That's kind of helpful when um, you have multiple people who need to take time off and take the turns. With both of those caregiver benefit forms, you need to get the consent of the patient to um, allow uh, the oncologist or the GP or the nurse practitioner to provide a release of information. So completing those forms is separate and then you need to get the medical certificate. A lot of these benefits, you don't have to wait for the medical certificate to submit both at the same time because the day that the government receives your application is kind of the day that they kind of start counting down the clock and getting things processed. So you can submit these application forms first and then the medical certificate separately. Um, and once they have both, then they can just approve it right away rather than waiting a week or two before you can meet down the doctor you don't have fill up these forms. So don't wait to just submit the first part. On top of the insurance uh, and point insurance that there are some tax credits, also tricky and haven't been super successful in getting the disability tax credit. Again, it's very biased towards people who are um, you know, on dialysis or uh, are blind or, or deaf or have other issues, uh, cognitive impairments, uh, which is not the majority of our lung cancer patients, but it's still worthwhile to try. Uh, we, we will still fill out those forms. Um, there are certain medical expenses that can be covered and it provided a website, uh, a, a link for you to kind of see what is considered um, covered, covered. I know for people that are traveling far distances to get to their cancer treatments, um, mileage, for example, can be covered. Um, so, but you have to kind of calculate all the kilometers in one way and it, it is kind of arduous. So make sure you keep uh, a a journal or a diary and keep all your receipts because you never know what at the end of the year when you're calculating how much money you've actually spent it all adds up so um, there's also a candid caregiver tax credit as well so there's actually stuff out there it's just hard to get but it's still worthwhile to try so again these are some of the health tips i kind of talked about it's important when we receive forms that all the form sections are completed so that we, you know, a lot of times um, when we fill it out, patients say, well, just mail it for me, like photocopy, I'll pick, I'll pick up the photocopy, but once you fill out that form, just mail it out. But if you don't complete all the form, all the sections or sign the thing, then we'll have to fill it out, then we have to call you to come back, okay, and then you mail it, so then that could cause a bit of delay, so that's something to kind of keep in mind if you have forms for us to fill out. Again, 
social worker, accountants, befriend them now if you don't have those friends because they are super handy. <laughs> Not the corporate accountants, but the personal accountants. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of practical needs, this section is really more for people that are traveling out of town, because I know there are a lot of people on the Zoom call. Um, but our Canadian Cancer Society does provide a lot of services for our patients. Um, there's a travel treatment fund that they will um, supplement people with low income to travel to uh, cancer centers for treatments. Um, they have a Wheels of Hope program for Prince George, Kelowna, and, uh, and Vancouver Island. Vancouver, we have uh, a big volunteer cancer driver society, and they drive from West Van all the way to Chilliwack. So they, since they started in 2017, and they get the they've driven basically the distance of Canada back and forth about 250 times. So that's the, the distance that they cover and they're completely volunteer run, usually older adults with previous family had, had cancer or they had cancer before and they're all volunteers. So it's amazing for education. Um, candy dart is another useful um, uh, support for people that are able to navigate the public transit system. So you still use your compass card for people on the little mainland to access the candy dart. Um, but they'll kind of do door to door service, which is much more convenient. Um, if, but they don't really help you get to the door, but you know, they will drop you off in front of your home rather than have you walk three blocks to your, from the bus stop to your home. So that's kind of me and any healthcare provider can fill out that form. Uh, Spark BC advocates for uh, people living with disability, and they're the ones that give the, um, the handicapped parking permit. Um, so you could register for that uh, if people are having difficulty getting in and out of the car, need more space, um, the wheelchair or the walker, uh, or if they need to be closer to the building that they're accessing because they can't walk, then th that permit is quite helpful. You can apply for a temporary one that's up to 12 months and a permanent one that's up to five years. And it's about $26 for an application. And your GP, um, nurse practitioner, or oncologist could apply for this. Uh, I've listed alternative ground transportation that may not necessarily be applicable for us folks in the lower mainland. And um, for more uh, programs for people that are traveling, so we have a lot of people coming down from the Sunshine Coast, um, sometimes from northern parts of the province coming down to Vancouver for PET scans and things like that. I've listed um, air, ground, and water transportation. Um, programs that are available through the government of BC, and there are ways of getting discounts on the, the, the fees and the costs. Lodging, we have four cancer lodges um, out of the six cancer treatment centers we have in the province, and there is, a, I put a link up here with the government of BC where you can look at what hotels provide medical discounts for patients that need to travel out of town for their treatments. And these are also alternative accommodations in Washington, and Kelowna and within Vancouver. And I've listed a whole bunch of other resources that, you <laughs> <laughs> that are available on these links. So that's why I said you can totally take my slides because there's so many, so many resources out there that you can look at. And I'm just going to advocate for our uh, BC Cancer Patient Family Counseling social workers. They're amazing people uh, and they are a wealth of information. So if there are any problems, these are all their phone numbers. You, can, you don't need to be referred by your oncologist to access them. You can just call them and say, I need help with such and such, and they'll get somebody to help you as soon as they can. So a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm way over time, I'm sorry. I just want to ask you any like source to the cancer people now we don't have to work to put a bed or spare items and a good reason. Yeah, so the question is about housing and people that um, are no longer have income or really struggling with the finances, whether there are resources. Our social workers are very helpful with that. Um, there are applications that you can do through um, BC Housing for um, reduced cost uh, housing co-ops, for example. So I did have one patient that successfully um, got, yeah, one patient, um, <laughs> that uh, 
it was approved for her to live in Little Mountain, and she got a single apartment and it was wheelchair friendly and an elevator. So our social worker did that. So I reach out to that. I didn't go into housing because that's another rabbit hole <laughs> of information, but our social workers can definitely help with that. And I think more than GPs, but you'll probably need uh, either the oncology team to kind of fill out the application or GPs can do that as well. I went to this work. No social work? Yeah, you know, I have a guide here. He said, I will go there and give you all my check. And now I said, that's a website you can get book. Oh, that's not a direct answer. You can go to the interrupt people like a social 65 years. There are none that are specific for cancer patients, but it's the BC housing is usually more for people with um, financial need. So it's all about um, calculating financial need. There's none that's specific for cancer patients. Yeah. 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 You don't get a lot of money from CPP. <laughs> you know, that's I don't know. Get off. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's about that advocacy piece about so there is a program that I've been successful in accessing that subsidizes my rent um, called Safer Housing. Um, you have to meet a threshold of income versus um, rent payment. I was getting 150 bucks, now I'm getting 35 because I pay too much in honorariums. But it's a whole different so our participant here mentioned uh, safer. Safer. It's under BC Housing. Under BC Housing that it has um, access to subsidized rental based on income. Based on income, and so and so Google BC Housing and it's called safe. Safer. S A F E R. We'll have to see what it stands for. Safe. Safe. And if you want to navigate that, I'll open your page and send you. Yeah, I think oh, that's I, 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 I still have it. So I can help on that. How to share it. Handy. <laughs> 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 the audience member who is still working at GC Housing goes volunteer for something. <laughs> and, and as you can see, yeah. I might be able to work with someone. I know. The uh, the one thing I found frustrating when I got diagnosed was <clears throat> I went on long term disability with my company. I thought it was great. I have access to that, I can have access to CPPD, and I would be able to survive. The first thing my long term the insurance company asked me for was how much are you getting on CPPD? And they deduct that. So now not only I don't get that money, still tax on it, but any program that I can qualify for, like PWD, any income I get goes directly to the insurance company. So this like this doesn't seem right. No. <laughs> and, I have and apparently that just seems standard in, mm -hmm. with all these insurance companies. They get like they're called first payee or something to that effect. I'm wondering if that sounds like is that have you heard that before or not? Because I would imagine a lot of people have long term disability coverage with their company. I actually haven't had people talk to me about it, although I'm not the right venue to kind of talk about it in general, but that sounds very frustrating. Hi, Tara. It's a pretty common topic on cancerconnection.ca. Okay. You know, um, one of the major insurance companies has that you know, yeah. And you and you go along working your whole life you're paying into this thing thinking that this is gonna be the path of that and that when you need it it's not there. It's not how you understood what was going on. And not not only that, your income is capped forever. Because like let's say CPPB increases because of inflation or whatever, you'll never get it. You'll never get what your Opt out of that at a certain point where you're like, this is not worth it anymore. Well, my long term disability is still more than I would get. Yeah, I hear people say that they got the CBPD 
and then when they hit 65 and got CPP, it was actually a lot less than what they got in that CPD. So it was worse off. Not only are you not really employable because of your age, you actually make even less money and it doesn't really cover the cost of living at all. Realistically, that's what you get. So I don't think CPP really increased all that much considering the fluctuations with like how much our, our dollar goes down basically. It is something that I think is really lacking in our population and older adults specifically. I think you have any questions on that? I think Adrian had a question. Yeah, you make too much. Yeah, but the, when you get the sentence, if you got, for example, the and people who are on plan P and have CPP or have CPD getting PWD from plan B because you're kind of labeled as unable to work federally too severely ill, so they do expedite that process of not this long, painful six month process of completion. Even for me, it could be done in less than two months. <laughs> uh, so, this question for the audience um, or maybe more of a statement uh, isn't that why many long term disabilities can stop paying at age 65? Because, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Plan. It's really disadvantaged for, for older adults for sure. A lot of our older uh, what do you call the farm care? So I just go out to farm care. But I'm also with my long term disability, I was able to I had to take over the payments to keep my benefits. So I kind of feel like I'm double covered. So I'm paying like $175 a month to keep my benefits, but I couldn't find out from Pharmacare like what's actually covered, like what drugs are covered so that I can compare. Because potentially, you know, with not a lot of income, I, I would really like to be able to not have to pay, get rid of my benefits. But like right now, my insurance company is one, again, who's benefiting because they can choose, well, Pharmacare is going to pay for that, right? We're not. Yeah, uh, there is a, 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 you just have to look up the provincial formulary and they do list what medications are covered, what prescription medications are covered in BC. So there is a website. I'll look it up and I'll okay. see if I can paste it on the slides, then you have access to it. Victoria, do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Bonnie. It's incredibly confusing system yeah. that we have and multi-layered and, and I can tell you, you know, it's no better in any of the other provinces. It's um, just, you know, although there aren't, the Ontario didn't have seven levels of coverage or 12, 12? Thank you also. I'd, I'd like to introduce now Claire Ford. Um, Claire, well, Claire is uh, recently retired from her 30 year career as an administrator, event planner, and a recreation manager in London, England, and in Vancouver. Um, she's worked for the British Olympics Association at the Atlantic Games and managed the Vancouver Hawks field hockey team and worked at UBC for a number of years. <laughs> so yes, I am recently retired. So um, I'm out of practice with this uh, public speaking stuff. Oops. 
Uh, so I am going to read my script. And uh, as my husband said, that's good because I won't edit it and say something I regret. So here we go. <laughs> oh, that's me. Okay. Anyway, um, can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you very much, Michelle, for inviting me to speak about my cancer journey. This is such a privilege. My journey is just one is just one of hundreds of survivor stories from people that I know who have quite frankly been a lot braver than me. But as lung, lung cancer patients, we're all in this boat together, trying to figure out how to improve our quality of life, um, wherever the starting point is. And despite in most cases, the seemingly insurmountable odds against us. Hope, the theme of today's summit, is such an important part of our collective experience as cancer patients. Wooey, sorry. <laughs> um, hope gives us the strength. Hmm. Yeah. Hope gives us the strength to face our cancer diagnosis head on and to approach our situation with greater equanimity. But we all know it's easier said than done. For many years, I kept my diagnosis to myself, telling only a small circle of friends afraid of the stigma and the inevitable question, did you smoke? Subtext, did you cause this upon yourself or do I have to worry about this myself too as a non-smoker? I was really stuck like a broken record, ruminating endlessly with negative thoughts about my past risk-taking behavior as a young adult and a future that seemed less certain. I eventually realized that I really didn't need to keep my diagnosis a secret. There are plenty of communities of people out there willing to share their cancer experiences and hope and provide hope and support. But just like my cancer, cancer diagnosis, I stumbled upon each of these communities along the way. My cancer journey started nine years ago, quite by accident. I was in my GP's office waiting to hear the results of a baseline scan of my spine for back pain. And I wasn't the slightest bit worried. I was a very fit athlete taking part in lots of aerobically demanding sports, like triathlons and field hockey. I was pretty confident the GP would tell me I had a slip disc, pinched nerve, or some such thing related to my active lifestyle. Well, it's a day I'll never forget. Technology. Um, Okay, um, well, today I'll never forget. Like all cancer patients, when they hear bad news for the first time, my GP walked briskly into the office, looking at the CT scan report, and lifted her head and said, Claire, have you ever had tuberculosis? I thought to myself, wow, that's a little random. Uh, so when I told her I hadn't, the bombshell was about to explode. My GP explained that I had multiple times, multiple tiny ground glass capacities in all the lobes of my lungs, and that I would need to be referred to a pulmonologist right away. I asked her if they were cancerous, and she said potentially, yes. I had no other symptoms associated with lung cancer, no coughing, wheezing, weight loss, um, night sweats, club fingers, you name it, none of those. So that night we went, we had uh, tickets to a Canucks game, and I remember just staring into the rafters. I was in disbelief shock and complete denial. I was angry too at myself because I was a light smoker in my 20s and I thought I had done the right thing by giving up more than 30 years ago. My husband and I met with a pulmonologist who told us that I would likely need a lobectomy to remove the larger, more suspicious nodule, still less than a centimeter, which was centrally located in my lung and therefore not amenable to biopsy. So the treatment plan was to watch and wait to declare itself. Fast forward to last April, that's nine years, when a CT scan revealed a small depression. Two months later, I had a successful upper lobectomy, the diagnosis, stage 1A non-small small cell adenocarcinoma, no lymph node involvement. I was very lucky and very poor. However, as my cancer was multifocal, I knew it was more like a chronic disease that would have to be managed with scans, with, more, with likely more treatment for the rest of my life. Caught early, yes, but no cure. <laughs> so, like all lung cancer patients, I have lived my life in a 
three, four, six, and 12 month increments from scan to scan. Scanxiety, a term used by patients to describe the fear and anxiety about possible reoccurrence and progression, became a regular part of my life. It hadn't got any easier, but by trying to live more mindfully in the present, I was slowly getting better at dealing with it. I kept reminding myself that worrying about what might be ruins what I have now, which is a very good quality of life, as good as it could possibly be. So I try not to think about it until as close to D-Day, crossing that bridge mentally when I get to it, rather than behaving like this poor sheep getting stuck on the rock, pretending everything's okay, but actually freaking out most of the time. I've listened to many self-help videos about anxiety, but I would really recommend listening to uh, Angus Pratt's YouTube video on the subject for a very moving account of what it's like. Angus is, as we all know, it's a stage four lung cancer survivor, a tireless advocate who has also survived breast cancer, and he's here with us today. So, in 2017, I started reaching out to people with whom I could feel comfortable about my potential diagnosis. Sorry, I could do it myself. Okay, um, so in 2017, I started reaching out to people with whom I feel could feel comfortable about my potential diagnosis. I've always been a fit fitness advocate, so on a hot summer's weekend in August, I participated in BC Cancer's Ride for the Cure with the UBC Faculty of Education, BCRT, and here. Uh, and this is where I was employed at the time. At the time, our team raised more than fifty thousand that year for BC BC Cancer Foundation. Meeting other people and listening to their survivor stories or those of their loved ones was incredibly moving and inspiring. The ride was a grueling distance, two hundred and fifty um, kilometers over two days. But like everyone else there, I was extremely grateful to be able to participate, particularly as I knew that surgery was in the offing and who knew what I'd be capable of after that. Next year, um, if my treatment goes well and the air quality is okay, I plan to participate in the ride again, this time to hope an appropriately named final destination. Um, quite frankly, I've always had a visceral fear of losing part of my lungs, so much so that I missed a scan and that was not a good decision. I thrived on challenging myself aerobically and couldn't quite imagine what it'd be like to lose 20% of my lung capacity, particularly if it wasn't going to remove the cancer that remained throughout my lungs. Well, with scans, you have to face music, trust the pro uh, professionals and the process, and take it head on. Thanks to my highly skilled surgeon and his team, along with the compassionate nursing care at PGH, I had a great recovery. Despite an air leak, which meant a bit more time in hospital and recovery at home with a chest tube and a pneumostat chest tra drain valve that had to be drained every few hours. It wasn't a with a few uh, trips to emergency, but it healed eventually. In August, three months later after my surgery, I was participating in a week-long master's field hockey training camp in Duncan, as if nothing had happened. Just like my surgery predicted only three months earlier. Guess where I am. <laughs> this year I participated in the Give a Breath 5K Run Walk, June 4th, with my husband. This run was started in 2019 by Tim Mons, an Albertan, who is a stage four lung cancer patient, an advocate for early screening and diagnosis. This year, Lung Cancer partnered with the Mons family to help raise its profile across Canada. I had planned on getting Fruit uh, out together to join me and my husband in Pacific Spirit Park, but um, I had been exposed to someone with COVID a week ago, so didn't want to take the risk, um, even though I tested negative. I hope those of you here today and listening via Facebook will take part in next year's Give a Breath 5K Run Walk on Saturday, June 3rd. There will likely be an opportunity to participate virtually or with others. And these details will be posted on the lung cancer website in the time. 
alongside the community fundraising and cancer research and detection, I also joined three patient-led communities, this time online. The first one was the Facebook Canadian Advocacy Group, Free um, Hope, which has been a wonderful way to meet others online with lung cancer across Canada, as an, and it's an invaluable resource for up-to-date information with treatment options, second opinions, events, connecting with others locally, in webinars, and opportunities for advocacy. Indeed, this is how I became part of a second patient-led community, the BC Lung Cancer Support Group, via Zoom, started by Angus Pratt, Debbie Harris, who has now sadly passed, and Alan Soon. This latter group has now expanded to a group of 15 of us, and I hope there'll be more of you who are listening or here today that will join us, Helen. Um, um, I cherish our bi-weekly Zoom meetings where we all have the opportunity to discuss our treatments confidentially and without judgment, exchange opportunities for advocacy, and pass on information we think will be helpful to each other. These online communities provide me with some of my greatest sources of strength and hope. And last but not least, I recently joined the XL 12 week online exercise program designed specifically for lung cancer patients. XL or Exercise for Cancer to Enhance Living Well is run by a PhD, sorry, faculty PhD in clinical exercise physiologists. Um, this program provides an easy to follow strength and conditioning program by Zoom, which can be easily adapted to suit the varying aerobic strength and fitness levels of the group. And um, what I enjoy about it most is I, I get to meet other lung cancer patients, um, because that's a greater sense of control over our diagnosis. And um, it's incredibly easy um, to follow and uh, well thought through. But of course, our healthcare. Our healthcare community of specialists is our greatest lifeline, working tirelessly on our behalf to provide the best possible treatment outcomes and without whom none of us would be here today. We know that the human and financial resources of our healthcare system is stretched to the limits. So as patients, we need to do our part to be proactive and informed about our treatment plans and to advocate for the additional resources we need to help us through our lung cancer diagnosis. Thankfully, there will be many other people like me in BC whose lung cancer will be caught early. This year, BC Cancer began a lung cancer screening program at 36 province -wide sites, providing access to 10,000 eligible high risk people. Additionally, durable drug treatment options in biomarker driven care via targeted therapies and immunotherapy for advanced stages means that there will be many more lung cancer patients surviving much longer in BC. But once diagnosed, we are pretty much left to our own devices to figure out how to deal with the physical, psychological, and financial fallout. There needs to be a more holistic and coordinated approach to follow up care for lung can cancer patients so they know where to turn at every stage of their cancer journey and at every turn in their treatment plan, particularly for those more marginalized sect sectors of the lung cancer population who may not have access to technology. Um, I was pleased to see, though, this morning that there is a Kind of program of nurse practitioners that will be following lung cancer patients in their journey. So I know that's a, a recent development here in BC. Um, so the great to see cancer patients refer to a patient navigator who can work with specialists to connect patients with the most appropriate resources to fast track decision making for a holistic approach to treatment. This may in turn improve a patient's quality of life and take the immense burden off the unsustainable uh, specialist led model of follow up care. So finally, I'd like to thank Lung Cancer Canada for providing, providing me with this opportunity to provide stories of hope to fellow lung cancer survivors here in person and virtually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, We'll, we'll take a short break now and we can take it, make it a little bit shorter because we're running a little over or so say about um, 10 minutes and uh, then we'll return to our program. Uh, Kelly is an exercise physiologist and research manager for the clinical exercise physiology lab at UBC. 
Uh, and that lab is dedicated to conducting research exploring the role of exercise both during and after cancer treatments. Okay. I just don't want to like start drinking it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a little message on there. So just, is that anything we need to do on the Anything we need to worry about? I can't see it, but I can kind of see it. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me here today. Uh, when we get an email saying we'd love to have, or there's been a request for information on exercise, we get super excited. <laughs> Usually we come in and people are like, oh. But when we actually get re requested, we're pretty, pretty excited about that. Um, my intent today. <laughs> My intent today is to give you a bit of an overview of the 2019 uh, guidelines for exercise. So we'll go through that in a brief overview today. Um, and then I'll also be speaking a little bit about MOVE, which is our current pilot study for lung cancer and exercise. And then at the end, I hate to leave people empty handed. So you will get some exercise resources because we like to make sure everybody has it. In fact, everybody that's here presently, what I'm going to be talking about in the slides, you'll see this a lot. You get one today. Uh, so you don't have to feverishly try and write it all down. And I think Michelle's going to make sure that there's access for the people online that they can access it too. I'll also tell you how to find it. Like, there'll be no excuses. Um, <laughs> meant in the best way. So I was going to start off giving you a little bit of insight for the guidelines for exercise that were created uh, and these are uh, for everybody to as you hear them think of where you're at and what would be the next approachable next piece so it's never trying to say you need to achieve this or there's no point it's where are you at what's the next the next logical step for you so think of it through those eyes versus uh, all of that I'm not Dr. Kristen Campbell, and I feel like I'm wearing her shoes today trying to speak on her behalf. She is in Scotland right now working with Dr. Anna Campbell on some bone metastases exercise guidelines. So there's some exciting work coming up our way soon. Um, but I am her research manager, and I oversee a lot of the projects that are happening here at UBC. Coincidentally, I don't work on UBC, so this is my second time on campus. I work remotely, um, so I had to have students show me how to find the space today, but they were very helpful. <laughs> uh, Dr. Campbell's work is dedicated to the role of exercise and cancer prevention, throughout rehabilitation, and then beyond. Uh, she's very well funded, uh, very respected internationally, and a, a note to what we're talking about today, she is or was co-lead on a very clinical paper that came out in 2019, which was the guidelines we're going to talk about today. So these guidelines are, were established through the American College of Sports Medicine, and they will create the foundation of what I'll present. The way this worked is there were, I believe, 40 delegates representing 20 countries that got together in 2018 to try and look at the last guidelines that were established in 2010 and figure out what the research shown since then and how to update the guidelines. The big takeaway that everybody should be aware of is that exercise training can be safe. And that's an important thing to remember. And that we have learned that we can really make a difference with some uh, cancer related symptoms, including physical fitness, um, physical function and quality of life, as well as um, mitigate cancer related fatigue. So I'll give you a little bit of insight. The next slide's super busy, so don't worry. Yeah, I know, you probably can't even see it. I mean, I have to squint to look. Um, but this is how complex the research project that we took on was, and this is the, uh, the infographic one. I'll show you a simpler one in a minute. But why I decided to keep this one up here is really what they did is they looked at all the research that's happened in any kind of exercise related trial and looked at the impact that exercise had on helping these eight different symptoms and looked at it from the lens of aerobic exercise, so cardiovascular type work, 
from resistance training work, more muscular work, as well as a combination of the two. And so there is very strong evidence that exercise does help with a lot of the symptoms. And then some moderate evidence that, I know my hands might be like, um, some moderate evidence that it helps with a couple other symptoms. Importantly, when you see something as a moderate versus strong, it doesn't mean it didn't work well. It means there's not a lot of research in that area. So I suspect we'll see these things continue to grow and change as more and more research happens uh, based on these recommendations. So a little bit more user-friendly version of this one is this infographic. And again, you're going to get access to see all of these. So I promise resources, you'll get them. Uh, so what this is doing is highlighting the different eight symptoms that they looked at. I feel like I'm right in the way of it. So I'll just go over here. And then what they've done is looked at, you know, they're all color coded. And we said, this dose of aerobic exercise made a difference on those symptoms. This dose of resistance training on these symptoms and this combo on those symptoms. So you can try and figure that out, but I'll give you a cheat sheet. <laughs> um, the big takeaway here is that cancer-related fatigue, health-related quality of life, and physical function are all positively impacted by aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, or a combination of them. So that's an important thing to hear is doing more regardless where you're getting started, may help. And so the general recommendations that I'm gonna leap into next are based on those strong findings. So again, depending on the symptom you're looking at, you can figure out what doses and what type of activity are appropriate. But the big takeaway is we can, we have strong evidence that those three make an impact. Or exercise makes an impact on those three. So this is the uh, document that we created for BC Cancer based on the, this paper. It is on the BC Cancer website. It's also on our website, which I'll tell you about, and it's in your pamphlet for everybody that's here. Uh, so the big pieces that we're trying to recommend here when we're looking at how can we try and get this messaging out is one, making sure everybody knows exercise can be safe. So that's the takeaway number one. And then building off that, trying to promote inactivity. So trying to avoid, or sorry, that's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Trying to avoid inactivity and promote activity. Uh, it's been a while since I've been a public talk. <laughs> I, and what we mean by that is finding those little gems of moments throughout the day that do make a difference. If there's an option to stand up for a while, and you're welcome to, go for it. If there's an option to walk further, go for it. If there's that little gems of movement that you can find throughout the day, and we always think of that stairs versus elevator, but I live in a small town where there are no elevators or escalators, so um, I used to stand on desk instead. But that idea of trying to find more opportunities to move more and to not be afraid of upping that, that game a little bit. The next thing to talk about is that aerobic activity. And so that's anything that gets the heart rate up, gets you feeling like you're working a little bit more. It's something that you can sustain for a while. For some people that could be brisk walking, it could be riding a bike, it could be swimming, it could be snowshoeing, whatever makes you excited and happy, that's what it should be. Um, what I wanted to make sure you hear though, is it's trying to think about how hard to work. That scale over there, um, quite colorful, um, we try to encourage people to work a little bit harder. So if, it, if you can hold a walking pace and talk to your friends and do that for a good long time, the next logical, logical step would be, could you go a little bit more brisk or find a little bit more challenging route or work just a little bit harder where maybe you're sweating a little bit more, a little harder to hold a conversation and just not fearing that little bit more work, but trying to, to embrace it and shift towards that. If you can find 30 minutes to sustain something super, if that's not attainable, start with less, but build towards that as a good goal. Once you can do that three times a week, then start building towards the ultimate goal of working towards 150 minutes of moderate to harder efforts of aerobic activity. So that's wherever you're at, where to start thinking about shifting towards if it's of interest to you. 
The other thing that gets forgotten a lot is the role of resistance training. So it's a lot easier for us to sell, go for a brisk walk than it is to do some strength training. Um, but we are trying to really promote, trying to find ways to move those muscles more and challenge them a little bit harder. Whether that's using body weight or using bands or using uh, fancy equipment at a gym or soup cans, it all will help depending where you're at. But trying to find good stimulus to try and make those muscles work a little bit harder. So that big muscles, a couple times a week, try and work a little harder than usual would be the recommendation that we shift people towards. And then the third takeaway, so I guess it's fourth, but I've been going in order, is to not forget to incorporate stretching and trying to get all the major muscles, but also don't forget about the balance challenges. Those are really important and they also tie right into um, working on the core strength and the leg strength, but they also help prevent falls and keep people up and able a lot more. So trying to find ways to challenge yourself, whether it's standing on one foot, closing your eyes, standing on carpeted surfaces, there are lots of ideas there. So those are the exercise guidelines. The one thing I wanted to point out is while these set, I mean, they are specific for cancer populations, but, big but, they're also the same recommendations that we make for all Canadians. So there's nothing different on those slides than I would tell any Canadian, they are the same physical activity guidelines. So keep that in mind too, is you get the same message. You guys just get to hear it. Um, so using those guidelines, what I wanted to then tell you about was our uh, pilot study that's going on right now. So there was some interest in the group to hear about MOO. So I'm here to also talk to you about this study, which is related to those guidelines I just went through. So MOVE is a pilot study that is going on right now at UBC, uh, BC Cancer. And uh, those are our, our PIs on the project. So we have a couple um, oncologists as well as a couple of uh, professors in faculty of rehab, or faculty of medicine, partner of physical um, therapy. So what MOVE is, is an exercise-based program that is specific for people uh, with lung cancer. How it came to be, if we go through the history first, I'll have to outline why we, where we landed, where we landed. So observations, when we try to come up with a research study, we're thinking, what do we know? What do we want to know? Where do we want this to go? So the observations that were noted included that within the lung cancer population, that there was reported poor physical function, there was reported increased fatigue and reported depressive symptoms. So if we think back to what we just saw a couple moments ago, a couple of those uh, symptoms, we know exercise may have a positive um, help, help with those. So that is something as we are moving forward. Then when we look at exercise, we're trying to figure out, well, what have been the, why aren't people moving? What, what would be the barriers? What are the things going on? What does the research tell us today as we move forward? So one thing we do know is that supervised exercise programs tend to be more effective. Uh, they tend to promote social connectedness. They help people feel more uh, motivated or accountable. Uh, they are known because they're safe, that people feel safer in them. So we know that supervised piece is important. So we kept that in mind as we were thinking about building this project. We also know that barriers to why people aren't exercising as uh, specific in the lung cancer population were things listed were included um, transportation, um, fatigue, not feeling able to leave the house to be able to come to regular appointments. So, and lack of time. So being aware of those barriers was something else we wanted to think about how could we, how could we address those and promote exercise still. And then there are very few clinical trials out there that include exercise for lung patients on active treatment. So that was another piece. So putting those all together, I'll show you where we landed and where we're at. So the goals of MOVE, were to create an exercise program that, that kind of ticked off that box. So supervised, so we have exercise professionals that run the program. 
uh, that it was group based. I'm jumping ahead and saying we do use Zoom as our platform, so it's a virtual delivery. Uh, but I don't, it's been very successful in keeping that social support and allows us to have a big reach. So that group based piece and the video conferencing also uh, allowed us to deal with the fact that some people don't want to travel or might not have the energy to travel some days. And then it also let us really build on that functional piece of movement. So it's a bit more uh, strength based, functional movement based exercises that we have the participants do. With every research, there's always a, a bit of a tunnel vision when it comes to what is the, the population that we're studying for the specific study. Once we learn from that, then we try and grow from that and see where we can expand it. So we do have eligibility criteria for this one. What I don't have listed up there is, and I'll feed into the next slide, I think, uh, is it, while it is virtual and that does let us have reach, there is travel involved with this one to come in for assessment. So it, it's, you have to be able to come to Vancouver site to do the assessments. So that's the piece. On um, some of our other studies, we have open across British Columbia, but for this one, it's because of the in-person assessments that it's for Vancouver or people that can get to Vancouver. The other thing that's important here is we, we're looking for people who are not currently involved in a regular structured resistance training program because that's what we're trying to see if, it, if it's helping. If you're already doing it, that's super. So for this study, what we do is we have our participants come in for two assessments where we look at your physical function and we run, I don't wanna say fitness tests, mm -hmm. fitness movement challenges to try and we see where you're at so we can compare you at the beginning versus afterwards. We also have, uh, we know people love forms uh, and questionnaires. Uh, we do have a series of questionnaires that we have participants fill out at four time points at the beginning, at the end. But we also like to take a snapshot at the middle and see how people are doing. And then we also take another assessment or have you fill them out once the program's over to see if things have continued the way they were during the study. The program itself runs for 12 weeks and participants attend class twice a week for 12 weeks. Uh, we have two instructors, one's leading and the other person is uh, our backup and we help make sure everybody can see what's going on or work with people if they're struggling or need new challenges. Uh, so we have uh, two instructors on and then up to 12 participants. Today we haven't had classes that big but close, they're usually around 10, so we're pretty close to max. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the exercises are resistance based, functional based. We don't use a lot of fancy equipment. We do use resistance bands and provide that to all of our participants and then body weight uh, as well. So you don't need to have access to a gym to do it. You need access to a computer and stable enough Wi-Fi and a chair and a bit of floor space. The program is going on right now. It is a pilot study and our target is somewhere between 24 to 30 participants that we're hoping to have involved. Uh, we are, we've had great success so far, which has been unbelievable. A lot um, due to our oncologists here that are referring straight into our program. And that's how most people get in because we do ask the oncologists to weigh in if the person's appropriate. So we have 18 people enrolled to date and we've finished one of our 12 week programs. And I think we're on week five or six right now of our second program that's going on. We're hopeful to be able to run another program uh, in early 2023 and we'll be starting recruitment for that one again soon. We have had, what's not up here, but I was just thinking about this as I was talking about the attendance piece. Um, we always look at our stats every week to see how things are doing. We have had, up until last week, we were at 100% um, attendance, which is like incredible. So if you know Risa, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, and then I, adherence so far, do you work as hard as we wanted you to work? Are you meeting that goal that we set up? I don't have it in front of me, but I think we're at 95%, which again is very high. Um, so people are coming and they're working and they're liking it. Uh, we do have some anecdotal reports. Uh, the, the biggest problem we're running into is people don't want it to end. 
Um, so they were looking for something to happen after they're done. They really like that connectedness piece. They like the leadership piece. Uh, so they're begging for more. So I'm sure if I'm here again in a year or two, I'll be giving another talk on a randomized control trial based on this. That would be, if I spend money on that, I would do that. So that's a bit about MOVE, just to give you a bit of insight. And again, I can answer a few questions at the end for sure. I, um, the last thing I wanted to do is just give you a little bit more opportunity to find things I just talked about because there's nothing worse than hearing about it and then you can never find it again. So very recently, uh, we created this website or our team created this website. Uh, so the link is there. It is cancerexercise.ca and then it will redirect you to the fancy UBC version. But that's all you need to know. So cancerexercise.ca. It's also on the handout, um, but on this website, and I, for time today, I'm not going to navigate it, but if you go onto this website, there's a snapshot there, there is access to a lot of information. So we have our publications on there. We have our infographics on there. We have links to our research studies on there. We have exercise resources as well as nutrition resources from BC Cancer on there as well as links to exercise programs uh, so lots of stuff in there hopefully it becomes something that people use if you ever find ways that can improve we're always going to my my undergrad students built it and i'm very proud of them um, but hopefully you'll find great evidence-based information on there because it's hard to navigate google so we tried to do the work for you and put stuff that we know is good stuff on there the last, and then this, this I've already talked about this handout, so we do have this handout for you, uh, but you can easily find it um, on our website under exercise resources. Uh, but it's also on the BC Cancer website page. If you have navigated that, you can find, uh, <laughs> there's some arrows to help you. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, if you can find it, then, or you can just, if you go to the BC Cancer website and you put exercise support, you will get here. And then it lives under more resources. So it is there, but it's harder to find. Um, so our website will bring you to that as well. And then lastly, there are lots of programs out there, but the two I wanted to highlight, and it's great because I know Inspire Health is here today, uh, but Inspire Health does offer some free exercise. They offer a lot. One of the things they offer are exercise programs as well, not research, uh, but drop in exercise programs and they have great attendance. I've sat in on a couple to see what they're like and I'm in awe when I was 90 participants. Anyway, uh, that's crazy. Uh, so it's cool, it's very cool. It is free. Uh, they do um, set you up with an exercise physiologist to do um a little walk through and see what my programs might be appropriate for you and any modifications you might need to do so we are really impressed with what they do and want to make sure that that gets out i also put wellspring on here so wellspring um similar is more eastern canada based um but they so they don't have a bc presence so far as uh buildings but they do what's called well on the web so they do offer exercise programs uh, virtually as well. So just so you're aware of other programs that are um, free, which is always a good thing. Uh, so research, we know that our programs sound like resources, but we're hopeful that they turn into resources that exist outside of research. So uh, that is our hope and our dream. Uh, so that's giving you a little bit of insight into exercise is safe, try to find ways to move. There are lots of great pieces of information out there. There are some research that's happening and there are a lot of free programs out there that you can access to. Um, the last sort of parting thing, and it's a, a, I know we were just talking about virtual classes. They work really well. We, when COVID hit, we kind of had to tiptoe into them like, oh, how do we pivot research? And so we try virtual exercise and it's been fabulous. And one concern a lot of people were worried about is when you have that mm, hanging out in front of the class before the class starts type thing or in the change room talk or whatever happens, um, that idea of people connecting outside of class time that the magic of in person 
it's happening on Zoom too. And just to really assure you that it does happen. In all of our programs, we open up our Zoom room early and we, our staff turns off their microphones and cameras and just lets the participants connect. If they come up in some of them, it's like, we're like, okay, you guys, wrap it up, we gotta get going. Uh, but it allows that opportunity for people to connect. Uh, so it's, I don't want people to be nervous about the virtual exercise. It could be a really great avenue for a lot of people. That's it. Yeah. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak to a group about exercise because we love it. <laughs> so yeah, if there are any questions, happy to address them, but make them easy, please. Yes. Yes. For me. Uh, so if you go to our website, you'll see the contact information. It's also on here. So the exercise.research at ubc.ca. You'll get me. I think that that's that's the easier than spelling my name. Uh, so you can email me for and I can get you more information. We will want to connect with your oncologist to make sure that it's appropriate. Yeah. So we do have a little bit more eligibility criteria than what's listed there, but I kind of gave you a bit of an overview and a few exclusions. Uh, but certainly between me and your oncologist, we can we can get to you. Can you stop my we'll Zoom? Next. Probably our next we just have to pick our dates and times that we're starting in the new year, but we'll be starting that again in the new year. Okay, so we're it goes in groups. So the next one won't start till January. So we're halfway through right now. Yeah. But there's still some other programs out there. So Inspire is another option for you too. And it's, a it's, a online program. it's a research online program. So it's a research study all online. Yeah. Except for the assessments or person. Yeah. Um, just curious if there was any looking to the future connecting for that in-person piece uh, to the seal team from UBCU connected to the seal. Yeah, so we do talk to UBCO and we talk to BC, we talk to everybody. We're always trying to find ways to stretch this. So because this is just a pilot, not just because this is a pilot study, it's got a very focused group right now. We're just looking to see, and we will need to look at the data and see what did we learn from it. And then the next logical step will be to start growing it bigger. Um, with this study, because this is our first foray into a lung cancer tumor site, we wanted to meet all of our participants in person to get a better sense of representation so we know. Some of our other research studies, we do all of our assessments online. And so we never actually meet the people, the, everything that like the tests that we do from a research perspective, we're successful in doing them online. But for this pilot study, we're doing it in person now. But if we didn't have to have that in-person component, it could be completely virtual. Yeah. So yes, hopefully yes. Okay. Nothing immediately. No, right now it's just. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that's happened with Excel is is they've moved into some pretty advanced training, and it's self-supporting. In other words, you pay a fee and you get yeah. Um, and, and they're finding that it's a good way of your graduate student taking a little extra cash, the moderator taking a little extra cash, um, and supporting it. And, and as a patient participating in that, I feel, I mean, I tried to find a, an exercise program in, in the lower mainland that was cancer aware, and I didn't find it. That's not how I ended up whining and begging and getting in on the Excel program. but. But it, 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 it seems to me that that's an opportunity for that kind of, is there any thoughts that the BC program will move in that direction or is it going to continually be focused on just research? Great question. And again, repeating it for the, the virtual audience. So uh, the work that we're doing, is there uh, a future for it becoming something more sustainable? Would that be best and yeah. becoming yeah. a service that's available in British Columbia? be it free or um, low cost. So this is a tough one to answer uh, because we're researchers from a research perspective, we do research. Our hope is that our research becomes services. And so we, yes, that is our dream. Like what you have just said is exactly what we'd like to see. We recognize the lack of services and exercise support. 
Uh, so what can we do as researchers to try and say this makes a difference to then find funders or spaces or communities training people to be able to offer these things outside of the UBC research hat. So super question, absolutely why uh, Dr. Campbell does this work is we want to see this turn into services. The logistics of that transition is always based on so many factors outside of our, our abilities, but that's why we do what we do. It's a whole different take on translational relationships. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, great comment, and yes, that's why we do what we do, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just curious, what's the gender split? Oh gosh, uh, I, I can only sort of say anecdotally because I haven't looked at the data yet because it's an active trial right now. I think it's pretty even in this group. Most, it's interesting because most of our studies, um, we have done one specific, like in breast cancer, the research that we're doing is for women or in prostate cancer. Um, this one is one of the first times we've done where this, it's not an eligibility criteria. I think it's pretty half and half, if not a little bit more male. And do you find any, like, if you had all the symptoms, do you find any difference in the symptoms that you do in your questionnaire between what men respond versus what women respond? So whether there are different answers based on gender for the questionnaires. Exercise. I'll let you know. <laughs> Reason being, we have because it's a pilot study, we don't look at the data until we're done. Yeah, so they, they, it sits in a tank, it's in a holding tank right now, but it'll be data that we have to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. A couple yes. of questions from the Zoom. Um, how do you gain back muscle that you've lost? Okay, excellent question. So, how do you gain back muscle that you've lost? It's Incremental, so it's setting expectations that it's slow and it's like slow is good. Um, and just finding those little challenges. So let me think back to that slide. It's trying to find muscle movements that you can do that are bigger muscles, more joints involved that are safe and trying to find a little bit more work that challenge the muscles. So we always try and say, just tuning it up a little bit more. If you can do a hundred of those repetitions of, the soup can bicep curl, it's a terrible example, and um, then it's probably not hard enough. So it's probably to find, you know, the Costco size <laughs> soup can or whatever it might be. But that, that incremental piece, you want to be challenging the muscle. Um, we always kind of work in like an eight to 12, rep, eight to 15 repetitions of something, and you're sort of tired at the end of that. That's sort of the sufficient amount of work to do for building muscle. And the muscles you work are the muscles that will respond. So if I only work my upper body, my legs aren't going to benefit from that. So it's challenging the muscles of interest, which could be all of that. Great question. And the next question is, how do you deal with weight gain caused by immunotherapy and steroids? That's another talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that, that's a hard question. We do, so how do you deal with weight gain from immunotherapy? I, we have a, we get that with a lot of our, our research uh, participants. We never focus on weight as an outcome measure. We'll take it to learn from it, but we're never focused on that. Uh, but we learn about it. So that is a combination of good nutrition practices, good exercise, good movement practices, um, and maybe focusing more on the things that are in control, like moving well, eating well, then focusing too much on the weight gain as the ultimate goal. Probably not the answer anybody wants to hear, but <laughs> the dietitian and the exercise physiologist in the room know that. <laughs> Great. All right. You guys let me off the hook easily. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. <laughs> um, I'm just going to introduce Shannon Smith. Uh, Shannon graduated with honors from UBC's Food, Nutrition, and Health Program and completed her dietetic internship in, with Vancouver Coastal Health. 
uh, in 2012, she's registered with BC College of Diet Dietitians and is a member of Dietitians in Canada. <laughs> Thank you. So, one little disclosure before we dive in. I am a dietitian and I am here on behalf of Inspire Health. The M there. Not entirely correct. I do have a bachelor's of science. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but not quite at that next level yet uh, with our master's. So just a tiny typo, but a, a big difference in that lovely amount of school that I have had. Um, so happy to be here today, my first hybrid. So we're doing lots and lots of Zoom, but lovely to see people in person again. So in 25 minutes feels very tight. Um, so wanting to walk us through supporting lung cancer with nutrition and what I'm planning to uh, kind of go through in the next 25 minutes. I'm curious of those in the room here, who's heard of Inspire Health? Your hands up. So for those joining us virtually, I think that was almost every hand that went up, which is lovely to see. Um, so I will do just a brief introduction to Inspire Health, of course, for those joining us virtually, because you can access many of our services throughout Canada as well. I'm going to touch on uh, nutrition during treatment. So looking at meals and snacks to actually put that nutrition recommendation into practice. So what does that really mean in real foods? We're also going to look at nutrition after treatment. And... Uh, when looking at nutrition during treatment, looking at ways to uh, modify any nutrition and digestive related side effects of treatment. So little changes that we can make to those common foods and snacks that we'll look at to really help to support the body itself. So Inspire Health, uh, who we are. We're a non-for-profit charity. We were founded in 1997. And the reason you see Vancouver in the center is we were the first founded location. Uh, everything we offer, one-on-one -on -one services and group workshops entirely free of charge, uh, partially thanks to being funded by the BC Ministry of Health. And then we also rely on donations and uh, fundraising from the community to provide the remainder of our funding. We actually just completed our biggest annual fundraiser this Tuesday, our gala, a night to inspire, and it was a beautiful event and very successful with our fundraising goals. Uh, there's no referrals required to become involved with any of our services, but they are available, which really just helps us to stay integrated with our allied health community, sometimes easing that connection with our services when things are feeling busy. Um, our services are offered online, and we are starting to welcome in person for any one-on-one -on -one appointments for folks that are close to any of our physical locations, being in Vancouver, Kelowna, or in Victoria. But we will continue with all of our online services, having had just such a resounding feedback of how more accessible that it is and how we can really reach other communities outside of those three locations. So here introducing our team at Inspire Health, and you notice the patients at the center, which definitely highlights our approach of patient-centered care. So we have, of course, dietitians and one of them, and we have three other lovely dietitians on our team. Uh, we have supportive care physicians, exercise therapists, clinical counselors, and our care coordinators are those lovely folks who will reach uh, anytime you call or email uh, to support any of our technology or our booking. We offer guidance and support for people living with a cancer diagnosis or those at high genetic risk, as well as their support people. Our programs and services all emphasize evidence-based lifestyle approaches 
that impacts the quality of life of people living with cancer. So keeping in mind, we're in a group setting here and knowing that nutrition is really complex. Um, so I'll be speaking broadly, including many different foods, but of course, uh, at Inspire Health, we take a very holistic approach around nutrition as well. Um, and we welcome all sorts of nutrition practices and diets. Um, so if I'm mentioning certain foods today that you don't include, just keeping those in mind, it won't be exhaustive, um, but using examples to really put that into practice. And part of that is everybody, your body is so different in what we feel best with, with our nutrition. And it's so nuanced as well. So many folks can have different circumstances that will impact their nutrition recommendations or their choices, whether that's due to cancer-related medications or treatments, um, or where you might be in that treatment plan. So whether that's preparing for surgery or post-operative, um, or previous health history, there may be reasons that inform certain foods you may choose to eat more of or eat less of, and digestion and bowel health can be big pieces of why we eat what we eat and how we tolerate different foods as well. And whether that be long-standing digestive function or side effects of treatment as well. So that's again, we're working on one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you're finding those kind of broader recommendations, just don't quite feel like they're helping with what you're trying to find, uh, really personalizing and fine tuning can be quite supportive for each person. So looking first at nutrition during treatment. Um, we know lung cancer treatment can really shuffle the body into healing and that can increase our energy, our calorie needs, as well as our protein needs as well. So finding those ways to really get in that quality nutrition to manage um, if weight loss, unintended weight loss or unintended muscle loss is present, um, finding ways to kind of sprinkle in those energy dense and high protein foods with every opportunity. So making every mouthful count. And sometimes that might mean if we're also experiencing low appetite, um, thinking about smaller more frequent meals and really supplementing those meals or snacks as much as we can. Um, thinking about those high calorie or those high protein foods and trying to integrate those at every meal, every snack. And again, we're going to go into what food examples this might look like in meals and snacks. Um, and that can really help to kind of stabilize that weight. Um, nutrition supplementation as needed. So that specifically for thinking about during treatment, that means nutrition supplementation of um, what we might consider oral nutrition supplements. So those pre-made kind of smoothies that sometimes are, they're a tool. They're like a medical nutrition tool. Uh, very different than supplements like vitamin or mineral supplements during treatment. Of course, we know we want to uh, be very mindful of that. Um, or if the oral nutrition supplements of the world that the boost or the insure isn't quite uh, the cup of tea that you, you choose, then finding those ways to make those yourself and really personalize those tastes and those textures that you could enjoy. And so looking at managing those more common side effects of treatment. So we looked at low appetite. Yeah. Yes, of course. Let me know if we get good feedback with a little audio check. I'll just dive back in. <laughs> so those, those strategies of having your small, your more frequent meals, maybe shifting from used to three standard meals a day, adding in extra snacks between. So that might look like five, six smaller meals through the day if you're really noticing those larger meal portions are just feeling overwhelming with lower appetite. Um, sore mouth or throat can be a common side effect of treatment as well. So noticing if certain textures or temperatures make an impact. So knowing quite hot or quite cold can be irritating. So finding those more neutral temperatures sometimes can be soothing or quite cold. Some folks find 
to be soothing and from that post -war. Um, being mindful of the acidity of certain foods, so those high tomato concentrated foods or uh, citrus fruits like uh, oranges or lemon and lime can be more irritating if they're not this spice or uh, so trying to reduce those more irritating components um, as well as just oral hygiene. So using uh, nice mouth rinse, using a teaspoon of salt, teaspoon of baking soda and four cups of warm water can be soothing. Uh, for sore mouth as well. And medications, of course, as needed. So if it has been recommended from your oncologist or your supportive medical team to use medications that can help to reduce those common side effects of treatment that really impact the ability to eat well or uh, digestion of, of using them when needed um, can really impact that quality of life and help to keep those symptoms more manageable. So I mentioned protein-rich foods, but thinking about what those protein-rich foods might look like, depending on what types of foods you do choose within your diet. So with each meal, each snack, um, things like chicken, fish, plain Greek yogurt or spear yogurt specifically are really, really concentrated in their uh, protein content compared to our regular more Balkan style thinner yogurt. Eggs, beans, lentils, or tofu or tempeh, um, any types of those legumes like chickpeas, uh, nuts and seeds or nut and seed butters, and of course also cooked beef or pork or lamb, which I didn't highlight here, uh, but just being mindful that of course they are protein sources, um, but thinking about that cancer protective component, really finding that benefit from those lean protein choices. But of course during treatment, kind of giving yourself that liberal um, Kind of allowance to eat those foods that feel best and that are appealing to meet those protein needs. Hydration during treatment as well can be um, something to be mindful of. So um, being aware first of signs of dehydration that could appear as fatigue, dry mouth, thirst, increased urine output, or really concentrated urine, especially if we're knowing that no medications are causing that color of urine um, and being mindful that many foods can hydrate and things can hydrate as well. So those fruits and vegetables or really fluid content uh, rich foods like soups or smoothies, those contribute to our hydration status also. And knowing how our bowels can impact our hydration status. So if you're experiencing loose bowel movements or diarrhea, uh, being mindful to replenish with each bout of loose stools, trying to have a nice fluid cup of hydrating liquid. Um, and even our, our coffee in moderation, that does still contribute to our hydration status. Of course, if it's only coffee all day, that would be a different consideration, but a couple of cups of coffee within uh, a day of otherwise uncaffeinated foods that can still contribute to our hydration status. Digestive function, of course, that can be impacted for many reasons with many different types of treatment. Um, diarrhea and gas being more common. Um, and so trying to limit the limits we're putting on our food intake as much as possible. Um, so starting first with maybe having more cooked or blended foods, knowing that that can really help to break down those fibers that can be more challenging for the digestive tract. Uh, so that might be um, blended soups, cooked soups, uh, versus the raw, beautiful, fresh vegetables that might go into those soups or smoothies. And if that doesn't quite resolve uh, the digestive challenges, temporarily having a lower fiber intake can really help to reduce uh, diarrhea if it's become quite predominant and being mindful of uh, the fat content. So a really greasy, heavy, fatty meals or deep fried meals can be exacerbating for that um, diarrhea more difficult on the digestive system. So that's, again, we're looking at those leaner protein foods also. Are you saying I have to give up butter? <laughs> <laughs> Listening to your body, right? So someone here in the crowd said, are you saying I have to give up butter? And so if you're having a lot of digestive discomfort and we're trying to kind of put on our detective lens and see, is that something that is quite predominant in your food choices and could that be contributing? And that's where we might look at butter. But butter, and of course, again, 
keeping in mind that each person's food choice uh, is so, uh, so multifaceted and so layered that um, not necessarily, especially if digestion is feeling good, it can definitely fit into a very well balanced uh, eating pattern. So putting that into some examples with real food. So some ideas for meals during treatment bowl meals come to mind because they can be simple and it kind of gives you just a bit of a pattern. They're really, really versatile. You can change the sauce, you can change your cooked protein, you can change those vegetables or the base, and it can adapt for whatever those needs might be, whether that's taste preference or adapting for digestion uh, concerns. So first asking, where's my protein in this meal? And we see here a very plant focused example of a bowl meal where we have chickpeas and quinoa contributing to the protein content, but of course, cooked chicken or fish um, could be a lovely protein source in there, or, or firm tofu or tempeh. Complex carbohydrates, that's our energy. So mindfully including some of those complex carbohydrates, whether that's something like quinoa or rice or potatoes. And if we are shifting to a lower fiber choice to manage bowels, white rice or peeled white cooked potatoes would be a nice lower fiber option. That's very easy on the digestion. But here we see chickpeas, quinoa, and yams giving us some of that nice energy. So when we're trying to stabilize energy as well, energy and weight, um, mindfully including that, that fat can really help to stabilize. So here we have avocado, tahini, and of course, little that naturally occurring fat from our cooked protein, um, even an extra drizzle of a beautiful extra virgin olive oil or a favorite cooking oil on top. Um, if unintended weight loss is present, that can really help to increase that calorie content, but doesn't um, increase the visual reference of how much food we're trying to eat in a day. So bowls are lovely options because they can be filled with plant foods, knowing that those colorful, vibrant plant foods are associated with many of those cancer protective considerations in our food. Uh, they can be simple and really versatile. So next example of a meal option or a snack option during treatment, smoothies. So again, they're blended, so they can be gentle on digestion. They can help to contribute to hydration and an opportunity to integrate those plant foods. So thinking about where's that protein in the smoothie. And of course, if the smoothie could also be a side along with a meal, so you might have cooked protein on the side, but if you're wanting to have an all-in-one well-balanced meal or snack, including something like tiny Greek yogurt, lets you really play around with the flavors you're adding from the fruits. Hemp seeds, soy or cow milk specifically have the most concentrated amount of protein compared to our other plant milks soft tofu, almond or any other nut, or seed butters, or of course protein powder, which I intentionally left last, because it's often thought of as the first source of protein in our smoothies, and of course it's an option. But we can also use many other whole food sources for that protein, and sometimes that can be even more affordable, because you may often use those other foods within other recipes and other meals too. So those complex carbohydrates where we get that energy that could be coming from the fruits. So your higher fiber fruits would be things like your berries, your lower fiber fruits would be things like your bananas or your melons. But of course, even adding things like oats, rolled oats or instant oats can be a way to add a little bit more energy density in there. Your fats, well, I have of to course. Say, what happened to kale? <laughs> kale could go in there no. if you like. Yeah, of course. What happened to kale? Kale can go in that smoothie. So again, that versatility. You can add in your fruits or your veggies. If you like to blend up your kale. <laughs> and yes. This is a question. I use protein powder. Yes. Mine has 26 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. If I were to leave that out, how much is something like Greek yogurt adding? That's a great question. So a question here from the crowd was, I make my smoothies with a protein powder that give me about 26 grams of protein. If I was to leave it out, how much protein would I be getting from those other ingredients? So if we were using uh, like a Greek yogurt or a skewer yogurt, depending on the brand, it averages from about three quarters of a cup, 21 grams of protein. 
a little bit higher depending on some of the grams, so 21 to 20 grams on that three quarters of a cup. Your nut butters, if you're putting two nice big tablespoons in there, you might be inching towards about 10, 15 grams of protein. So you can definitely get close to that 26 grams in a combination of foods. And your milk, if you're adding a cup of either of the soy or cow milk, will add about 10 grams of protein. And so I think I touched on different ways to integrate fat into your smoothies. Avocado. Does it sound weird to anybody here? No. When I first saw it going in a smoothie, I thought that sounded weird, but it adds a lot of creaminess. You don't have to notice a lot of taste. Um, can be a way to add some fiber as well. Nuts and seeds or ground flax seeds. That's my 20 minute timer. <laughs> Five minutes left. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, here we go. Soups. We can integrate hydration. We can blend or cook. These soups are actually examples that we did a cool soup cooking class in the summer because I was finding in the hot weather, anytime I mentioned soups during treatment, I got a lot of oof, way too hot. But thinking about what a soup could be, right? So those blended cooler soups, these were zucchini and basil soups. Um, and sometimes when we think of cool soup, we think of gazpacho, which of course is a tomato base, which can be quite acidic, but there's quite a few other alternatives that you can use including your protein foods, your complex carbs, noticing if that crusty bread feels at all irritating for the mouth, adding in the nice soft breads or crackers into the soup itself and soften. And of course, our fats. Snack ideas during treatment. I find this often the word snack can uh, elicit the snack aisle in a grocery store, but really what a snack is meant to be, is just a smaller portion of food that you enjoy. So ensuring you've got that nice protein in there, whether it's sliced apples with almond butter, cooked eggs, energy balls, or simple trail mix. So getting that, that carbohydrate component, as well as that protein component of our snacks. Nutrition. That's where we might start thinking about cancer protective nutrition. And the research shows us that plant focused or plant abundant diets, including lean proteins and whole foods, really has that evidence for supporting cancer protective nutrition. And specific to lung cancer, we see interesting research around the potential benefits of those omega 3 fatty acids that we find in fish, as well as tea. Um, so the omega-3 fatty acids we find in fish, as well as plant sources like walnuts, ground chia or flax, um, and hemp seeds. We also see potential benefits of tea, of uh, the cruciferous family like kale, Brussels sprouts, or cabbage, which brings back our kale question in our smoothies, of course, uh, whole soy foods, turmeric, strawberries, persimmons, grapes, apples, cucumbers, and onions. Focusing on balanced nutrition that supports balanced blood sugar. So again, that looks like those meals that include a beautiful amount of protein as well as those more complex carbohydrates if high fiber foods are tolerated. And the part you can't really see is eating the rainbow. So finding that color component. So we looked a little at Inspire Health, who we are, what we offer. Thinking about meals and snacks <coughs> during treatment, finding those calories, that protein, ways to sneak that in, sprinkle that in with every bite. Focusing on small, frequent meals, managing bowels as needed. Nutrition after treatment. I'd include plant-filled diets, our lean proteins, and those components for managing side effects of treatment. So if anybody hasn't connected before with Inspire Health, their dietitians offer one-on-one -on -one appointments available to any person living in BC. Throughout Canada, you are welcome to uh, join us for any of our group workshops. We have online cooking classes and workshops, um, as well as lots of recipes on our website. Support people are very welcome to access all of our nutrition services as well. 
just a little image of our site, how you can get involved if you'd like. A very busy slide, just giving an overview of how much monthly group programs we run. So, so appreciative for that uh, mention of our exercise programs. Um, but we have our nutrition focus programs Tuesday mornings at 11. We have our workshops and then Thursday afternoons every week. We have cooking classes on Zoom. Um, there was a question from the audience. Yeah. When might acupuncture be starting again? Ooh, so the question from the audience here was when might acupuncture within Star Health be starting again? Uh, actually, specifically in Victoria. In Victoria. It's a good question. I have to admit since my time being with Inspire Health, uh, we haven't had acupuncture. So I'm not sure if there is oh, okay. a definite plan to bring it back um, and when that might be. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Ooh, great question <laughs> here. Um, what are my thoughts on intermittent fasting? And that also could be an entire talk I know. Uh, for a good hour. Um, I think the research is really compelling and interesting. And it's very personal and individual of how that might be implemented um, in your particular case and depends on kind of what you're trying to achieve from it. So it's a, uh, a topic we talk with folks one-on-one -on -one with very often about how that might feel and how that might be implemented for but it's something if it's appropriate for all of the cancer patients that needed support. Yes. Like the 16 inches. Yes. So the, the follow-up question was. If it feels appropriate for that patient, is it something that we could support and inspire help? And the answer is yes. You mentioned yogurt in terms of fermented foods, but it's a question that comes up fairly regularly in various support groups in terms of uh, other, other things like kombucha, sauerkraut. Um, kefir is one that often it causes a lot of controversy because of its connection to yeast and yeast infection. So the question from the crowd here was, I mentioned yogurt, but um, curious about the connection to fermented foods uh, similar to yogurt like kefir or others and how that might um, be considered for immunocompromised people. So a good question, also a very big uh, question, and it kind of, again, that piece of every body is so unique and it kind of depends where you're at and what you're experiencing. So post-treatment might be a different consideration, um, but generally we do see in moderation, including naturally fermented foods within your regular eating habits. So thinking about what in moderation means, um, outside of water, eight cups of any one food is a whole lot of that food, even if it's kale and it's wonderful. Um, so thinking about a half to, to a cup of that food, um, close to kind of moderate, depending on what that is, of course, um, that can be well tolerated. So thank you so much, Shannon. Um, that was a good step there. Uh, I do want to say that um, we will be sending out the slides and all the information on Inspire programs and Inspire Health, uh, as well as the Excel program, which was mentioned. Um, it actually came out, like it just started as a uh, pilot study in Alberta and has, you know, it is now being sustained. So, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> and the only we are doing a BC Excel program as well. So it's oh, in the works right now. Right, too. Yeah, so Excel has a lung specific yeah. Um, program, yeah, which we, we encourage them to oh, develop. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our last speaker today, not least, um, was Laura Floyd. Laura Floyd uh, was born and raised in Victoria and worked in communications on Parliament Hill for a number of years. 
She was pursuing a second career in law when she was diagnosed with lung cancer in 2020. Since then, she has focused her energy on raising awareness of lung cancers. I'm going to do this. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm not sure what needs to be done with the, oh, um, the stop sharing a screen, or you can, they could just look at my face there. That's a nice picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> I took it myself. I'm quite proud. Um, okay. I don't know if they, yes, I think I see where I am. I'm in the middle. As long as I stay here, I think the people on screen can see me. So thank you, Michelle, um, for having me here today. It is it's a pleasure and it's a privilege. Um, and when I say privilege, I mean it's a privilege to be alive and be here with all of you who are also alive because lung cancer um, kind of has a pretty high mortality rate. Lung cancer is a pretty fearsome adversary. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, and I was struggling a lot because I'm kind of an odd case not just personality wise, but like statistically. <laughs> um, every year about 100 people under the age of 40 in their 30s are diagnosed with lung cancer. And out of those, maybe a couple dozen are diagnosed soon enough to be eligible for curative treatment. So I got the whole gamut. I got uh, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, I had surgery, I'm on target therapy, I've had thoughts, I've had prayers. Um, varying degrees of success with those various forms of treatment. Um, but what I thought about rolling it over my head many, many times, I was reminded of, of course, um, the World War II Hungarian mathematician, Abraham Wald, as one naturally is when you think about lung cancer. Um, and the story where it followed me, it, go, it connects, I promise, I promise. Um, <laughs> Abraham Wald's famous for a lot of things, but in particular for his work on World War II aircraft. Uh, what was happening is the Allied Air Forces were just being destroyed by the Germans. And they brought together a group of scientists and they said, listen, it's too heavy to armor the entire plane. So we need you to look at the planes that come back and figure out where to put the armor. And so they assembled this team and everyone on the team said, well, gee, the bullet holes, they're in the wings, they're in the tail. That's where we need to armor the planes. And Abraham said, and I imagine this is a verbatim quote, but he said, whoa, 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 hang on there, fellas. Those are the planes that come back. Those are the planes where when they get shot, they're able to return. Those are the survivors. So the people who aren't surviving, the planes that are getting shot down, that's what we need to be looking for. We need to be looking for the missing bullet holes. So when I tell my story today, I'm gonna bring up a few places where it could have so easily been missed, where I could have had that turning point where I could have been shot down, like so many people are every year, um, especially young people who don't qualify for screening, um, who don't get caught until their cancer has spread, often throughout their entire body and are faced with um, a very shortened lifespan. So that's what I'm hoping my story will, will bring out today is just what had to come together for me to get a diagnosis before my cancer had metastasized. Okay, so enough about Abraham, let's talk about me. Um, it was about two years ago, October 1st, 2020. It was a dark and stormy night. Uh, no, actually it was a beautiful sunny afternoon in Victoria. And I had just um, gotten off the phone with my doctor. So right away, yes, I have a doctor. Um, you don't have one of those, pretty easy to get shot down. And I had called my doctor because for about the past month, I've been having just weird symptoms. Uh, symptoms of high blood pressure, high heart rate, generally just feeling weak um, and random intermittent chest pains. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm, I'm having a heart attack. I'm 39 years old and I'm going into cardiac arrest. Um, but before I ran off to the ER, I talked to my doctor first and I, we went through the symptoms and he could have shot me down. He could have said, Laura, you work a stressful job. Are you eating properly? No. Are you sleeping well? No. Are you exercising? No. Sorry, don't look at me. <laughs> um, you know, when I was halfway through my job at a pro bono legal firm where I was doing my articles. So, and I also have terrible posture. So all of those things could have been explained and I could have, you know, 
my, my doctor could have shot me down right there and said, make better life choices, girl. Um, even just taking that step to call the doctor. I think we're the first people who shut us down. We're the first people who explain away our symptoms and say, yeah, I've been getting more and more tired, but well, there's COVID or I'm getting older. I'm not exercising as well. So right off the bat, um, just taking that step, having a doctor to talk to and a doctor who listened to me and didn't just dismiss me. Um, this was during COVID, obviously, so we weren't doing it in person. And by the time he called me, he was very apologetic. He said, I'm sorry, all the life labs are closed. You should go to the ER and get checked out there. And it was like being a kid again and my mom telling me to go clean my room. I was like, oh, do I have to? I don't want to go to the ER. That's so annoying because, you know, what was going to happen? I was going to go to the ER. I was going to get some tests run. I was going to wait in a big, busy room full of sick people to be told, like, make better life choices, girl. Do some yoga. Have a vegetable. Uh, maybe don't smoke quite so much pot um, and <laughs> stop wasting hospital resources and be on your way. But I did. I, was, I did the grown-up thing, and I took my doctor's advice, and I rode my e-bike the 10 minutes to the ER. So there's another place where lots of people get shut down because not everybody in BC lives 10 minutes away from an ER and not everybody is able to just pick up and go. They have responsibilities at home. They have childcare they need to take care of. They need money for transportation. This is an extra cost they never included. But I was able to, I just, I called my husband. I said, you're making dinner tonight, put the kid to bed. I'll be home late, I'm going to the ER. I don't know when I'll see you again. <laughs> Hopefully our child will still remember me. Um, and I went over to the ER and got my information taken by a very unimpressed triage nurse who was clearly thinking, make better life choices, girl. Um, but still, she signed me in. I had my ECG. I had my blood work taken. I went into the waiting room. And to my delight, there was hardly anybody there. There was like eight people there. I don't know who's been to an ER recently, but I swear this is true. It sounds like a fairy tale. It was like eight people there. And so I knew it wasn't going to be a long wait. That's another place I could have been shot down. And where I know people these days are being shot down because they show up, they've got random symptoms. None of them are life threatening, but they've been kicking around in the back of their head. They think something's wrong, but you go into the ER and you're told, oh, it's a 10 hour wait. How many people are going to wait 10 hours? Not many. Not many people are going to wait that long. At least I wasn't going to. Um, I have like a two hour max, which is about how much time it took. I got in to see the doctor and she said to me, your heart's fine. And I got ready to be told, go home and do yoga and sit up straight and eat your vegetables. But she didn't say that. She didn't shoot me down. She said, and I think maybe because she was a little bored, because it was a little bit of a quiet night in the yard. She said, I was reading through your intake form and I noticed you checked shortness of breath. What can you tell me about that? And I said, well, you know, I, I have trouble playing a full game of soccer now. Um, I get winded going up hills. I traded in my manual bike for e-bike, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, like I'm getting, I'm pushing 40 now, you know, so I'm getting up there and uh, I'm not doing a lot of exercise during COVID. And I was downplaying it. I was shooting myself down. And she said, well, why don't we send you for an x-ray and just rule out anything? I was like, Sure, let's do that. Um, so I called my husband. I said, come and pick up my e-bike. I'm going to be here a little longer. I won't be able to ride home in the dark. Um, but at this point, no worries. Not a single worry. Um, I get the x-ray. I go back in a little while later to see the doctor. And she says to me, and this is not a very good way for the doctors in the room, um, don't start a conversation with, I don't want you to worry. <laughs> it's not. It's like... <laughs> What? Instant turn the worry switch on. But she said, I don't want you to worry. Something showed up on your x ray. It's probably a test infection. It's probably bronchitis or pneumonia. And statistically, she was right. That's probably what it was going to be. 99.9% .9 of the time, someone in my category, in my demographic, that's what it's going to be. Um, and she said, don't go to the worst case scenario. So me being a bit of a smart ass, I was like, what? Like alien spores are growing in my chest. And we both had a good laugh because, well, what's it going to be? It's not like it's going to be cancer or something like that. That's ridiculous. Of course, it's not going to be cancer. 
um, of course it's not going to be cancer. And I remember thinking that, like, of course it's not going to be cancer. Um, for those of you who were smokers, I throw that guilt, throw that stigma away. Um, three of my four grandparents were heavy, heavy smokers. Both of my parents were raised in homes filled with secondhand smoke. And my brother and I used to joke, like, we're obviously immune to lung cancer because of all of this smoking in our family, and nobody's ever gotten it. Nobody has. I think my one grandmother, she probably has a 60-pack year smoking history. Um, never got lung cancer. My other, I have a grandfather who smoked for 40 years. He's still alive. No lung cancer. Um, so it was the furthest thing from my mind. And uh, she could have said there, you know what? Show something. It's probably a chest infection. Here's a prescription. Let's send you home. And that happens to a lot of people. And statistically, as a doctor, I'm sure it's the right move. But at that time, again, maybe a little bored. This was that lull in COVID where there wasn't quite a wave. They were waiting for a wave. The vaccines hadn't started yet, so all of the elective surgeries were canceled and people were actively avoiding the hospital because that's where all the COVID was and you didn't want to go there. Uh, so instead of sending me home with a prescription, she said, I'd like to send you for a CT scan. And I said, oh, okay, that's the one where you feel like you're going to pee, right? Is that, and she's like, yeah, that's that one. I was like, okay, because I never had one. It was my first time. And you never forget your first time. They're all a blur since then. But that one, I was like, this is kind of novel. This is interesting. I'm going to get an, an IV in my arm. They're going to put me in this machine. How cool is this? And then um, had that done. I get back out to the waiting room and it's just me. I'm the only person in the waiting room at this time. I know, I know this sounds like, like, what? That's not true, but it was, it was just me. And I've been sitting all day. So I started just doing laps around the waiting area, just like stretching my legs. See, I was getting my exercise. Um, <laughs> and I think this was a little annoying for the nurse because at a certain point, probably at my 20th lap, she calls out, she says, excuse me, we're just waiting for your results. I was like, okay, and nothing personal. I knew it's a long day. It's a stressful time to be a nurse. Like, here's this person just pacing and pacing. I didn't stop pacing, but I understood it could be annoying to her. And then I just caught out of the corner of my ear. I heard her say, oh, there they are. My results were in. And I peeked over as she put the button. And I saw past the uh, plexiglass fortress that she was in through her 16 layers of PPE. Um, her expression changed and I went, oh fuck, uh, I think I have cancer. And I still remember that feeling of seeing it in her face. And this is another place where I know now, but I didn't know then, where I could have been shot down is cancer is sneaky. Cancer likes to hide. Cancer likes to camouflage itself with other things as um, maybe it's a chest infection, maybe it's inflammation, maybe it's scar tissue. And the radiologist said, oh, this could be something. And the doctors think, oh, this could be something, but we're not sure yet, so we'll wait and see. Come back in six months. Um, but my cancer announced itself. It was like a little cancer pride parade. It was like, here I am, I am a malignant tumor, uh, right in the upper corner of my lung, about the size of a golf ball with little spindly spider legs reaching out to me. Um, I didn't know that. Of course, I didn't know that's what was happening. I do know when I got brought into the special room where they tell you that you're going to die, um, that it wasn't good. And then my doctor came in with tears in his eyes. And I'm like, that's also not good. Um, and says, is there anyone you want to call? And I'm like, oh my God, just tell me, do I have cancer? It's a little torturous at this point. And I'd only been waiting like an hour. And it was the longest hour of my life. And I asked him, is it cancer? And he very clearly and concisely to the point said, it's a mass with characteristics indicative of malignancy. <laughs> and I said, so it's not cancer? And he said, well, the characteristics of the mass indicate malignancy. And I'm like, so it is cancer. He's like, well, I'm like, no, if you're going to say the same thing again, no, just, just. Um, anyone who feels like I don't want to burden people with my story, 
learning feels like, what is my story going to add? Um, that's what it adds. Every little story that we tell people, whether it's our doctor, whether it's conferences like this, whether it's our, our friends and family, helps to reinforce. It points out where those weaknesses are. Because again, we're the planes that have so far made it back. And so many people don't. So every time you tell your story, every single time you do that, we strengthen the community a little bit more. Um, and even listening, listening to someone's story, which I really appreciate because cancer is trauma and trauma is cancer and neither the twain shall part. Um, the courage that it takes just to listen, um, the courage that it takes to share, those are the things that make a difference. So uh, thank you all so much for, for listening to me today. Um, those of you who I've met already, you're all wonderful people. I wish we'd never gotten to know each other, um, but I'm glad, I'm glad that we did. Thanks so much for listening. Michelle, I'm not sure if it got communicated to you, but it, there was a request from Zoom that the people that are here parade across so that they can see you. Yes, <laughs> it was. Um, thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was wonderful. I, I tell patients, you know, every day that their story, just their story, is powerful, and it always is. Every time, every time I hear it. So, um, yeah, so thank you everybody for being here. Um, we're, we're going to um, do a little parade for the people who have joined us over Zoom. So if everybody would like to come up. Yes, and see, if, uh, as for those of you, for, for those on the Zoom call, if we can take a screenshot, that would be very great. You can take my <laughs> Take pictures, yeah. To the guests. I'm going to take a few. Okay. Three, two, one more. Three, two. What about you guys? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 What about yourself? Oh, Are you from? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so short. I'm so tall. I'm going to take a few again. It probably looks like I'm going to the Three, two, one more. Three, two. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Adrian's going to share it with you guys. Thank you so much. I will edit the background out. Okay. <laughs> So um, just so everyone knows, we do have this venue for, for another hour or so. So if you want to stay, um, have some more snacks, have some coffee, tea, please feel free to do so. On behalf of the patients that are here and the patients that are on Zoom, I just want to take this moment to thank Cheryl and Michelle for all of the work and the other folks that have spoken here. But, but particularly, I know this was a very stressful time for you, and I'm really grateful that you took the time to make it. Sure. I just, you know, myself and, and like it's kind of wants to bring patients together, and that's what it's a pleasure to do so. And you know what you
Amazing, Angus. Wonderful job. So <laughs> <laughs> going to be. That's not Shannon there, is it? No. No. Oh, that sounds... I believe Cher was on earlier. Get rid of that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah. I'm going to hop off, okay? Okay, yeah, me too. Um, oh, or can we close the Zoom? Is that okay? Anxiety, we're talking a lot, and I'm in the show with one of our Oh, yes, I remember now. Yes, yes hi. <laughs> I, think so I, I think, yes, we can, I think we can close Zoom, unless there's anybody who would like to stick around. I did, after that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I thought I sent in a registration form.